Oh, you're on the East Coast. I'm on the East Coast. Okay. So you're so that's actually so 1150 for me. Okay. So is that, yeah, I guess gonna, right. No, I think you're two hours be, uh, ahead of us. Okay, I'm two hours yeah. ahead of you. Yeah, okay. we're, we're in mountain time. And oh, then we've okay. got central time. And then I guess they call it East Coast time. Yeah, East Coast time. Yeah, New York. Yeah. You're in New I'm, York. Are I'm you outside here? of Philadelphia. Oh, okay. So, okay, so that makes sense. So then actually I'm on at 12.50, my time. I think so. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's correct. Yes. Yep. Okay, great. Okay. All right. right. So I, all right. So that works out. So I'll be back. So this is the right link. So I'm in the right place. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, all right. Definitely. So I'm going to probably, you know, listen okay. to some presentations and then I'll be back uh, 1250 to do my, my time. Okay. Sounds, all right. sounds, sounds good, Wendy. And you have okay. your, you have your PowerPoint ready to go? I do. So I can do a, a, a screen share on the yeah. PowerPoint. Yep. Perfect. Okay. okay. Awesome. We'll speak to you soon. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Looks like we got Taylor. How's it going, Taylor? I'm good. How are you? Oh, good. I'm just um, trying to make connections with everyone. It helps make sure things occur in a seamless way. So, um, so I probably should know a little bit about you, Taylor, um, cause I'll probably have to, I'll probably need to introduce you. Um, let me, let me get a pencil here. Wh what are you majoring in by the way, Taylor? Secondary education and science education. Okay. So, so Taylor, Benavides. And could you repeat your majors? Secondary education and science education. And science education. Now, is that dual major, by the way? Yes, it is. It is. Okay. And you will be our, mod our uh, moderator. So you'll be moderating the, uh, the sessions. Um, keep in mind that there's one session that I allowed um, the presenter to um, continue into the next session. And so I'll, his name is um, Brian, and he's going to be talking about um, safe injection sites um, for two sessions. Uh, Starting, uh, let's find out when he comes on. Okay, yeah, he starts at nine thirty. Okay. So he'll be he'll be doing the first two sessions. Okay. Cool. Um. So and so, do I have to? Do I just continue to let him talk, or do I have to like? Yeah, I, think you, I think you can just continue letting him talk. Just perhaps tell everyone that. He will be um, talking from 9.30 to 10.05. Okay. Yeah. Do you have the schedule there on your screen? Yes. I'm looking at it right now. Okay. Per per perfect. And then do, um, so we're not getting pushed off into um, rooms, correct? We're still just staying in the main room? Yes, that's correct. It's just going to occur in this room. So. so so um, kind of going like the way that Katya and I had talked about, like switching off, um, am I introducing Eddie or are you introducing him? Um, perhaps I should. Okay. Yeah, I'll introduce Eddie. Okay, um, so we have Valerie. Um, good, to see, good to have you here. Hi, good morning, everyone. So I thought I would introduce you as the, the wife of the university president. Uh, sure. Dr. Joseph Shepard, is that good? Yeah, okay. that would Very be good. true. <laughs> yes, that's true. Exactly. I, I didn't know if I should introduce you in a, another way, as like associated with the you know, Central Intelligence Agency or not. But, but whatever, I, whatever you like. Yeah, I think I'll, uh, I think I'll just uh, downplay that. So, um, 
let's see. I let me check this chat box here. Um, Tuan sent me a message. Could you click participate? Um, quick question. Uh, I had planned to speak maybe 10 minutes or so there and then open it up for if any Q and A because I'm speaking about the Nimbus Press. Does that sound about right? Yeah, that sounds perfect. Okay, good. Yeah, perfect. So, um, okay, Tuan, you want me to make you a co-host? Let's see if I know how to do this. Tuan, I probably go to more. Co-host, I think I did it. Uh, did I make you a co-host, Tuan, now? Not yet. If you click on participants um, at the bottom of your screen. Okay, yeah, I, I, I think I clicked on Benji. I just made Benji a co-host too. Here, I made a mistake. Uh -huh, I'm gonna kick you all. <laughs> um, let me find Tuan. There we go. Let's try this. Okay, there we go. Okay, so I made you Tuan a co-host, and Thank Benji, you, you're you're a co-host too. So, <laughs> and I don't know what that does, but it must be something beneficial for you. It gives the security options. Ah, got it. Perfect. That will be good. So uh, we got one more minute. And we'll begin here momentarily. Uh, I think it's being recorded. Yes, it is. So uh, we'll begin here in just one moment. Probably we'll want to. Okay, we got Bill Norris. Welcome, Bill. Welcome, Dara. Welcome, Gina. Welcome, Russ. Oscar. For those students that are presenting um, live, just keep in mind that you're going to want your presentation ready on your screen so that you can uh, share it uh, if you have a PowerPoint or something to that effect. Okay, so well, it's nine o'clock. I think we got all the important players uh, now on the screen. Uh, and I think I will begin. So without further ado, my name is Scott Fritz. I'm a professor of history here at Western New Mexico University. I have been teaching here at the institution for 15 years and um, my focus, is the history of the United States. Um, by the way, I conduct research. I do research on the history of small business here in New Mexico uh, in the early 20th century. And I focus primarily on the history of Grant County uh, and Hidalgo County. That is the southwestern quadrant of the state. And I hope in the future to uh, write a book on the history of small family owned businesses from about the year 1900 to about 1973. So that's who I am, I do research um, and I teach here at the university. Um, this symposium is about students, however, and it's about student research. It gives students the opportunity here at Western New Mexico University to do uh, to participate in an academic conference without having to travel vast distances. And you know, when we were all in graduate school and now perhaps you're a, a faculty member, you go to academic conferences. Well, we're trying to give students that experience. Um, the first uh, student academic symposium uh, was back in the year of, I think 2005, when I first came here as a uh, faculty member. So um, I don't wanna really talk too much more about uh, who I am, um, but I do wanna keep in mind that we're gonna have about five to seven presentations that will occur in this Zoom room. We also will have a student keynote speaker who will speak at about 10.30. We also have um, digital posters as well as digital videos that are found inside the Canvas shell for this symposium that um, you can view on your own time. So those presentations are what we call asynchronistic. 
Um, there could be some students that will be attending the Zoom room or will be inside the Zoom room who could answer any questions that you might have regarding their digital posters or their digital videos. Um, so um, that might be um, uh, that might be a possibility. Um, so we also um, will have a moderator. Her name will be Taylor Benavides. Um, I'll introduce Taylor Benavides um, uh, after our first keynote speaker um, is to address us. So I'll uh, introduce Taylor Benavides uh, here momentarily, but I would like uh, to also mention too that Edward Misquez will be our student keynote speaker, and I'll introduce him around 1030 uh, this morning. Uh, but what I would like to do, um, also I need to also make sure that we all know that for students who are participating in the symposium that, that there will be t-shirts available um, at Miller Library. So. Um, after the symposium is over, and if you're here on campus, go by Miller Library to pick up your, your t-shirt. And there are also going to be uh, certificates of participation um, for uh, the students. So uh, you know, keep this in mind for the students that you are participating in an academic conference and that what you should do is put that into your resume or in the academy, we call them curriculum vitas. And that in your curriculum vita or your resume, um, you'll wanna have a section that says something like academic conferences or conference papers and list the title of your presentation that, um, that you gave here uh, this morning into your resume. That's gonna help build your resume. And I should argue then too, that the certificate of participation is further proof that you participated in this conference. So it's gonna help you in your future career. But without further ado, I would like to now introduce our keynote speaker. Our keynote speaker is Mrs. Valerie Plame. She is the university president's wife. And so now I would like to introduce Valerie Plames and please give her a, a nice warm applause. Uh, yeah. Hi, good, good morning. morning. Thank you so much, Scott. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for asking me to participate in this. I was checking out the site and the various really wide array of diverse projects that will be presented throughout the day. And it looks fantastic. And I am uh, very happy to be able to kick this off for you. Um, I was asked to speak to you this morning about something that I've been involved with, I'm really passionate about. You may have heard of it or not, it's the Mimbres Press. And the first nugget of the idea started about a year ago when your provost, uh, Jack Crocker, uh, we knew that he was working on a book of poetry. And we were, uh, uh, Dr. Shepard and I were really eager to see it and and uh, and we're like, well, what about doing a press? And that is what led to where we are today. Uh, we have uh, a, a, the Mimbers Press up and running. Provost Crocker's book has been published, and I want to tell you a little bit about it, uh, what we're doing, what we're what our goals are, why we think it's worth a worthwhile project, and then I welcome some questions at the end. So I'll only be speaking for about 10 minutes or so. Um, the, the mission statement, when we really sat down and thought about this, uh, what is it we want to do and why is Western a good home for this? As you might know, a lot of university presses are focused on strictly academic works. And with all due respect, sometimes they're a little dry. And we wanted to uh, open up are what we are bringing to the world uh, in publishing besides just a very narrow slice of academia. And the university is situated in such a beautiful, special part of the world, the Southwest region of the United States. 
And it doesn't take much to look around to realize what we have that's so unique here, whether, whether it is the beautiful geographic setting that we are in, the border issues that we have dealt with for centuries, uh, the arts, the culture uh, that are attracted to this part of the world, it really is uh, a special place. So we wanted to celebrate that. So in our early days of beginning to get the press set up, we thought we wanna be open to works uh, that cover all these areas, whether they're anthropological, historical, uh, of the arts, and of course, we don't want to shut anything off. So as we are uh, getting the, the press uh, together and, and standing it up, if something came our way that we thought had more national or global significance, but they wanted to be published by Members Press, we would not turn them away. So uh, the beginning had a little bit of the sense of, let's put on a show, you know, how hard can this be? It turns out that uh, we dropped in just as publishing is in a profound period of change. Uh, as you probably know, you, you know, if you want a book, a real book, you probably don't go to your local bookstore. Uh, so much is available online. And the other thing that has really changed in that regard is over the last few years, really, I would say the last decade, it used to be where self-publishing was uh, looked down upon as a vanity press idea. That is no longer the case. Uh, the, the first big breakthrough of that was, uh, you may have heard of that uh, whole racy series, um, gray, uh, gray, whatever that's called, uh, um, Shades of Gray, that was it. That was started out as a self-published novel that obviously exploded, became a series, became uh, movies. So that took away the idea that you can't make money and no one's paying attention if you self-publish. So uh, uh, early on, it started with Provost Crocker. Uh, we brought in a friend who is a friend of the university. Uh, she is a social worker, but has also spoken and published uh, quite a few books, Marvel Harrison. And we just started getting to work of what this would look like. And, uh, I'm going to share, take a moment and share my screen. So in, this is our uh, the website that is attached to um, the university website. I'll just show you very quickly. There it is. Uh, hopefully you can see that now. And we have. Uh, uh, Jay Hempel's beautiful photographs to, sh to really place where we are uh, of the Mimbus Press of Western New Mexico. Um, we, and the first book off the press was Jack Crocker's the Algorithm of I, which by the way, um, has been uh, published to really rave reviews and even talks of possibly being submitted for the Pulitzer Prize. It is that good. Even if you're not a big poetry fan, I urge you to uh, take a look because it's very special. And I'm uh, saying that not because uh, Provost Crocker is my friend, but because he takes a sweep of his own history and takes using words to new heights. A couple things I want to draw your attention to, please. At the very top, you will see student submissions. We have, and I'll click on that, um, we have a branch of Members Press that is going to be devoted to publishing online academic work by Western undergraduate students. You can see here more about it, what they're looking for, what they will accept, um, creative writing, and as in whether it's this section or the other uh, regular submission session, section, um, you just like with any agent, any publisher, you need to tell us what's it about, uh, what uh, couple sample chapters, how you think it might go. And um, I want you can contact Yen Chu, it says there, her email with any questions. And she has put here a QR code. Uh, scan that and you get a chance to be published, whether it's artwork, essays, research. It was important to us to include that whole student section because your voices uh, as part of this are really crucial. 
We have um, a, an author section, news and media, which continues to grow, updated. Uh, and our, I just want to show you in our about section, here's our advisory board. And in fact, we just had a board meeting yesterday. Uh, everyone attended in by, via Zoom. We aim to do one in person here at Western once a year. And I have to say, I'm really proud of everyone that's on the board. They bring so much experience and thoughtfulness to this enterprise. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to see as we're really beginning to take off, take flight. The staff, as I mentioned, Marvel, and also your very own JJ Wilson, who has been a, a, a wonderful leader. And he is uh, has full of ideas of how we can uh, continue to grow the press and uh, shape it in coming years. And I just want to show you one last thing here. Members Press, uh, why did we decide to name that? As you know, it comes from the indigenous people that thrived here about uh, a, um, a millennia ago. And your beautiful museum has so many beautiful pieces of pottery, and this is one of them. And we decided to incorporate that courtesy of Paul Hotfett, a local artist, to put that into the logo right there. So I am going to wrap up there and open it up for questions. And uh, thank you again for your time and your attention. And I really hope that you will check out the webpage, definitely check out the student submission site and, uh, and spread the word. Okay, so as master of ceremonies, let me open this up for questions. And oh, th thank you very, uh, very much, uh, <laughs> Uh, any questions? Because uh, I do have a question. Uh, sure. I'll wait. I'll wait. Does anyone does, does anyone have a question before I, I ask mine? Uh, yeah. Hi. I, I have a question. Uh, I'm curious. How often uh, do you publish? I guess like or how many uh, publications do you do per year? Great question, Oscar. We are aiming to do uh, for a season, so that comes out to approximately when we're really up and running, maybe eight books a year. Uh, we're still in early days, of course, figuring out the logistics of everything, but we would love to do that. And on balance, we, we want to have a really nice uh, diversity of types of books that we are uh, publishing, whether it is history, we want to do, we were talking yesterday, which I think is a brilliant idea, an anthology, Wisdom of the Southwest. We have a book of poetry. We are uh, being, we have been approached about a, what should be a work, a great work of nonfiction about uh, heroin, uh, the, the horrible, you know, what happens to a small town in New Mexico when you bring in heroin and meth. Um, so you can you get the very briefly the idea of what we're looking for, and the numbers is somewhere around eight or ten to start. All right, awesome, thank you. Uh, other questions? Because I'm wondering, uh, it sounds like uh, the press will accept nonfiction. So I, and I heard you say the word history. So I'm, I'm always a, a great advocate for the study of history and uh, particularly the local history of this area. I do, uh, basically I volunteer for the Silver City Museum. Uh, yeah. We, yeah, we have a um, participant in this morning's symposium. His name is Javier Marufo and he's the new curator over there at the Silver City Museum but he's also a graduate student here at the university who will be pursuing a, a master's in history uh, once we get the program up and running in the fall semester. But he's already starting to take uh, graduate level courses in history. And he has taken a lead on what's called the Chihuahua Hill Oral uh, History Project. And so he's been um, conducting interviews of the Hispanic families that live up on Chihuahua Hill. Mm -hmm. and I wonder, would the members press be interested in a book related to that topic? 
I absolutely. Uh, in fact, I would. Uh, nice to meet you, uh, Javier. I was just at the museum for the first time about a month ago, and I was really pleasantly surprised. I see the beginning stages of the Chihuahua Hill uh, project, and that's exactly the sort of thing that we would love to highlight. Um, whether it's local history or further throughout the region, native peoples, border issues. Uh, there's, an, uh, Scott, you'll pre as you know, amazing history here that we want to bring to light, uh, at both of uh, historical nature as well as local issues and the arts and uh, recreation. I think that uh, if it's a, if it's, a good subject that either tells a great story or uses words in a beautiful way, we would absolutely be open to uh, consideration. Great, thank you, thank you. Uh, other questions uh, uh, for uh, uh, Valerie Plain. Uh, Bart. Thank you, Scott, um, and good morning, Valerie Plain. Um, I joined late and I don't know if you answered this question already, um, but I was wondering if you, the members press was, had any interest in doing audio books. Hi Bart, great question. Um, I don't know, no one, no one has uh, asked us that yet. Uh, typically they do go hand in hand. I, I'm not familiar if they're just books out there that are only available via audio. Typically, uh, they accompany a text as well. But uh, if you have any ideas, please check out our submission site or please feel free to contact me directly uh, or go to JJ probably is better, JJ or Marvel. And you can find all that information on the, on the website. We would be absolutely delighted uh, for everyone to take a look at the website. If something comes to your mind or you know someone who is uh, looking uh, for a home, we would love to perhaps be that home for them. Thank and I want to I want to say I think he's still on here. Um, a lot of credit should really go uh, to uh, Joe Shepard, and I'm not saying that just because he's my husband, but he's the one who had the vision to go. You know what? We need this. You have seen so many amazing changes on campus physically, how it's looking, how it's improving, as well as internally, how things are being run and the growth. And this seemed to be a natural fit in continuing uh, the growth of the university and into raising the profile. So it was uh, Dr. Shepard who was like, you know, let's, let's see if we can make this work. And I, ha I have to say after the board meeting, this was our second one uh, of the year yesterday, I am really optimistic that we're gonna make a, make a go of this. Uh, Julie Morales, who's uh, Dr. Shepard's chief of staff, she will have sort of administrative overview. So if she's also a person you can go to for, um, for any questions. Yeah, let me give uh, some kudos out to uh, Dr. Shepard for, uh, you know, most universities have like something akin to a university press. And so this is uh, a great thing for our university to uh, have such a such an ability to uh, publish authors. It really helps to uh, showcase uh, not only our university as a whole, but our students. I, I found it very interesting, uh, uh, Valerie, that uh, that. Um, that students can apply uh, to uh, publish uh, through our, 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 our press. Um, are there other questions? Because I have one, I have another question, but I don't want to take center, I don't want to take center stage. So does someone else have a question before I ask? Okay, Taylor, go for it. Have you already gotten um, student submissions for the press? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I know that in the, the standard portion that we've already received, I wanna say 15 submissions. Um, I, I believe there has been a, a couple in the student part, but check with Yen and she, she can tell you more specifically. Um, of course, the idea is you get a lot of ideas and not everyone gets to be published. Uh, you have to meet certain standards and so forth, but um, I love that we're at the beginning of what looks like a great adventure. 
Yeah, so uh, my, my question, um, I think I was talking to, talking to Gilda Ortego. She's the director of the Miller Library. Does my memory serve me correct that the office for the members press will be located in Miller Library? Oh, uh, good question. Yeah. Um, I think that is true, but I don't know for sure okay. uh, yet. Yeah. Oh, so I, so I guess my question then would be, will there be a, a physical office on campus eventually? I think that would be the idea if we yeah. grow. Uh, that makes sense. Although, you know, in, in this uh, not quite post COVID world, as we know how much you can do virtually, um, how much can be done. You don't all need to be in the same room, uh, but sometimes that one on one interaction is crucial, which is why we are going to have a board meeting in per person at Western at least once a year. But um, we are we're trying all sorts of new things, the publish on demand, um, how to we, we'd like to do our artwork, keep it local as much as we can. We want the press to be sustainable. Uh, we keep that in mind, environmentally sound. So these are our values and you can read more about it on the website, but uh, uh, I, as I assume that yes, an office ultimately will be set up. But right yeah. now it's probably JJ's office. <laughs> the, or maybe it was JJ that she was referring to. Yeah. Like, right, there's the treasury room there in Miller Library. I'm just putting this on to everyone's radar. There's the treasury room. And then there's another little office just to the left. Um, so I will ask. Yeah, yeah, that would be that. Okay. Um, well, any other questions uh, for Valerie Plain? Well, I will see everyone, I hope, or if you're on campus still at the Mingle and Jingle, that's tomorrow night. Um, if not, I'm wishing everyone really happy holidays. Good luck today with those that are presenting. And thank you again for allowing me to uh, be the first one here at your symposium and wishing you all really well. Okay, great. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, as master of ceremony, I have to make sure that we have a, uh, that we allow, a, a, Russ, do you have a question? I did have a question. Um, if, uh, if if Miss Plame is still there, anyway, um, the the question I have is, I remember that Jack Carter used to publish through a concern called Membrous Pub Publishing, and I'm a little confused as to whether there's a relationship between Jack Carter's Membrous Publishing and Membrous Press. I think we will have to take that question offline because I do not see our keynote speaker to address that question. Um, so uh, Russ, could you um, send that question to me through the chat box? Sure. That would be great. And then I guess I will forward it uh, to Valerie Cla uh, Plame and uh, somehow get the answer back to you. Thank you. Yeah, in include your email to me so I can provide you that answer. So what I should now do is uh, um, get ourselves ready for our uh, first uh, live presenter. And uh, before I do so, I want to introduce uh, to us all, um, our moderator for uh, these live presentations. And that moderator's name is Taylor Venavides. Taylor Venavides, she's a, an education major. In fact, she's doing a dual major in secondary education and science education. And like I said, she will be our moderator who will be moderating um, all of our live presentations for the next few hours. So Taylor, without further ado, um, let's, let's welcome Taylor. So thank you, Taylor, for being a moderator. Well, thank you. I also wanted to um, say that I do have a co-moderator. Her name is um, Katya. 
Uh, I don't have a full background, but I know that she is um, working in the library and she is also sponsoring a large event that is there. Um, so we are going to be switching um, off and on between the presenters um, just to just to do it. So our um, I'm going to wait just a few more minutes to introduce our first presenter because he does not start till 930. Um, but Katya, if you wanted to introduce yourself and um, give the audience just a little bit more information, it would be wonderful. Good morning. Uh, my name is Kathy Barra. I was a former student here at Western. Um, I graduated with both a um, secondary education degree and an English as, as well. Um, I work at the library currently and um, I'm also part of the symposium committee. Um, I guess we are just waiting for um, our presenters, right? Yes. Are we all set? Um, let me see here, here. Yeah, we have the first presenter that uh, just made himself visible now. His name's Brian Stengel. Okay. All right, um, Mr. Brian Stengel, are you ready? Yeah, I am. I just, I have uh, two, logins going. So I'm trying to do a, the slides on one and um, the microphone on the other. Okay. So while you get all set up, I just want to remind everybody that um, you guys have 15 minutes to um, um, conduct your presentation. And um, just in case like you slightly go over the limit, uh, we will be like like softly reminding you about that. <laughs> Let me just uh, uh, interrupt, I'm sorry. Um, I, we, we've given Brian 30 minutes because he has a really cool topic and he's really passionate about this topic. So he actually has 30 minutes. Okay. No break, I don't get so, a break in between. <laughs> <laughs> so if you guys, these projects are actually really cool, you guys have 30 minutes to do it. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, we'll be here till tomorrow. <laughs> Okay, well, um, I guess I can get going if everyone's ready. Okay. It's that, it's that time. Let me see if I could uh, share the screen. I don't use Zoom as much as I should. Here we go. All right, I think I'm gonna try and kill the video on this one. We'll keep the audio and so I could see what I what you see. Okay, so um, basically, I'm a, a substance abuse counseling major and uh, dual majoring in psychology as well. Um, since 2019, I've been doing a, a heavy research on this topic, and so I have a lot to cover. I'm going to try and talk as fast as I can. Hopefully, y'all can keep up. Um, Let's see, I need to minimize that. And so basically what I've been studying is, is the, the opioid epidemic in general, aside from alcohol and drug addiction. So getting started to go over the, the, the important statistics with the, the opioid epidemic is, um, and these are all reports from the, the CDC that I actually verified last night. So they're pretty up to date and uh, accordingly, as it stands, more than 130 people die from an overdose every day in the US. Um, at the 12 month ending of, ending at April, 2021, more than, actually it was 100,306 people have died from drug overdose. Um, and those are reported, that's, that's just reported. So um, that's an underestimate by far. Um, of those who died from drug overdose, 75, over 75,000, 75% basically were opioid related deaths. Um, we know fentanyl has made a huge impact on this, on these numbers and uh, including in every drug, 
categories. So basically people who are dying from cocaine and meth and, and, and drugs not generally associated with opioids, are, they're finding fentanyl in their systems as well. So, so fentanyl is really infiltrating all drugs. Um, annually, opioid misuse costs the United States $7.8 billion every year. And surprisingly, um, this is from the, a survey from a few years ago, uh, roughly 10.1 million people aged 12 and above abuse opioids in 2019. So uh, it's kind of scary to put that in perspective. I, I have a graphic here. We can see here at 2013, it starts to spike as far as synthetic opioids. By 2019, we're at 36,359. If we look back 20 years to 1999, there was only 730 deaths from synthetic opioids. And that's primarily fentanyl. Um, so as of 2013, when fentanyl really started to kick off in the United States, it, it, it got, that's when it started getting bad. Well, what I'm gonna be covering is a form of harm reduction. So what is harm reduction? Harm reduction, according to the Harm Reduction Coalition, is a set of practices, practical strategies and ideas aimed at reducing negative consequences associated with drug use. It's also a social movement that respects people's rights to make informed decisions about their health. It enables people to better manage their use, their drug use. It supports abstinence for those who choose abstinence. It reduces the spread of disease through safer practices. It also um, has the principle of meeting people where they're at in life. Instead of forcing a person into recovery, uh, harm reductionists are, are, are meeting people in the midst of their addictions and encouraging and, and providing support for them to get out of their addictions when they're ready. Um, and so, so on that note, it, harm reduction considers both the actual using as well as the conditions which a person is, is using in. And that's where we get into some examples of harm reduction, which include syringe or needle exchanges, um, on-site drug testing for purity and an adult adulterants. And I'll get, to on, back to that in a second. N naloxone distribution networks, which the naloxone is the, the life-saving drug that reverses the effects of uh, opioid overdose. Um, they also include wraparound medical services, such as wound care, as well as professional training um, on safe drug using practices, community mental health referral programs, homeless outreach intervention, referrals to medication assisted therapy, and rapid response overdose prevention programs. And that leads me into my next slide. What we're looking at here, this is the naloxone. This is what is used generally four milligrams, but because fentanyl is so potent, we're now, the, 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 the FDA has actually approved an eight milligram version of this because the four milligrams, the single dose four milligrams are just not, not um, not cutting it. They're having to, to dose people multiple of times to bring them back from an overdose. This is the drug testing. This is, these are basically just, fat, these are uh, like litmus strip types of drug testing. They're, they're fairly cheap from factory, but the availability is very limited. And I, I just, even just looking for them around um, Silver City, I, I was not able to find any outside of the Department of Health, that's concerning. So what I'm gonna, uh, the, the rest of my speech is about overdose prevention centers. There's several names that have been used and that's the second half of, of the lecture. But according to New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio, overdose prevention center services offer safe, clean places where people who use drugs can access clinical care and other services. The first SCS or, or uh, safe consumption site in this case, or overdose prevention center, like I said, there's multiple names, began in 1986 in Bern, Switzerland. Um, at the moment, there's more than 120 sites operating in 12 different countries. Um, 
Every safe consumption site has a proven history of reducing the spread of HIV, hepatitis C, STDs, as well as reducing ER visits. Clients, according to the numbers, clients are 30% more likely to utilize add-on treatment services, such as detoxes and, and other services that introduce them into the, the paradigm of recovery, as I call it. Now, the public benefits are also outnumber the, the, any, any negative side to it. So, so with the public benefits, we're looking at less hazardous litter. So there's uh, syringes and things like that. People are not throwing them away. There's, these places provide a place for them to safely dispose of these, these type of things. Public intoxication has been proven to be less. Um, public disorder, crime, and the, the amount of money saved is enormous. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's very significant. Um, and ba basically, uh, over the past more than 35 years, not a single life has been lost in any of these uh, safe consumption sites or overdose prevention centers, not one. Now, if, if we put that in perspective, had the U United States done this, if I should, I guess I should let you know, we, we didn't up until a few days ago have any of these programs. So had we started doing this in 1999, when we started tracking the deaths from opioids, we could have saved upwards of 840,000 lives. Um, and uh, some research translates that into years of human productivity. So at 841,000 lives, that translates to approximately 28.6 million years of human productivity lost to opioid addiction and, and deaths. This is a picture of InSight. This is the first Canadian safe consumption site or uh, overdose prevention program. As you can see, it's very sterile. It's very hospitalized. Um, it's located in Vancouver, British Columbia. This is a mobile outreach safe consumption site. So these guys go into the communities. And, and this is one, one aspect I'm really pushing for here in New Mexico, because as, as far as I know, we only have one or two, and they're both located in Albuquerque, which doesn't do any of the rural communities of New Mexico any good whatsoever. Here's another couple of examples. These ones are from Montreal. The name is French. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. L'Anonymy. Anyways, they, they go around, they, their schedules, 11 to 5 a.m. They hit 12 different neighborhoods per shift, and they also offer on-call services. So these, these are bringing the harm reduction to the communities as opposed to making the communities seek out harm reduction, which is not the way it should be. Of course, as I said, the US has zero government, but it changed two days ago, I'll get to that. We have now, uh, to my count, two government authorized sites and one underground site that is not operating legally. And so I couldn't do much research on that. According to the argument that has been used historically, the crack house statute is an old statute back from the 90s, or sorry, the 80s. And um, it's, it really is antiquated and we need to get, get more or less get rid of it. So back in 2018, a nonprofit organization called Safe House, they plan to open a safe consumption site. And they're, they're a com uh, Christian group that, whose primary aim is to save lives. However, in 2019, U.S. Deputy, Deputy Attorney General Rod Ro Rosenstein, he threatened to prosecute anyone who opens a site and he cited the crack house statute. Ironically, our now President Biden was principal to making this statute happen back in the 80s. So I'll be happy to see if he manages to reverse it. 2021, New Mexico unanimously, unanimously voted seven overdose bills to Senate. Sadly, they all died. Um, the one I was tracking was House Bill 123, which was going to provide, uh, uh, facilitate legal, uh, legal, basically legalize these, these, these um, overdose prevention programs. July 6th of this year, Rhode Island, they legalized the first site and they actually called it the harm reduction site. So instead of the safe consumption site, the provisions, uh, they're slated to be effective on March. And then 
Two days ago, New York opened the nation's first two, and see, they're using a different name. They're using um, overdose, uh, what is it, overdose pre um, prevention centers. So they opened the nation's first two overdose prevention centers in upper Manhattan. Uh, as far as I know, they haven't been pounced on by the feds, but we'll see how that goes. Um, the reason why we're having such difficult times with, with the, the drug war in general is because of stigma. Stigma goes back to Harry Anslinger when he started this whole marijuana scare with, um, and, and uh, Dr. Fritz would know this because I've actually talked to him about this. And as you can see, that marijuana is the most violent causing drug in the history of mankind. That's, that sets the precedent for stigma as a whole. We, well, many of us know that what, what he said there is, is simply not true um, by any means. Today, this is what stigma looks like. And I don't know, some of you might remember, this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs. And then I found an, a more modern one that is vaping makes you a lab rat. And um, this one in the background is this mouth brought to you by meth. And you can't see it very well, but he's missing all his teeth. And so this is, these are, these are the, the myths and the, the, the lies that are being spread in order to create this stigma to, to perpetuate the drug war. Uh, the United States has been very active in spending money on researching this topic, just not in the United States. So verified, and I, I verified all of this myself, spending by the United States National Institutes of Health. I found three grants uh, from 2007 to current, the research was all on safe consumption sites. The award recipients were all Canadian teams at the University of British Columbia. The total tax dollars spent through 2020 was 14.17 million. Total dollars paid to University of British Columbia, mostly for addiction studies since 1998, is 115 million. Um, Canada's access study, which is, deals with these safe consumption sites exclusively, has been in uh, been been in progress since 2005, and it's 100% funded by the Na the United States National Institute of Drug Addict um, yeah Drug Addiction. Their VITA study is also partially funded by NIDA. That study started in 1996 and is up to current. So we've actually been paying for quite a bit of this research, and yet we still have nothing except for a couple of days ago. One way that we can pay for it, um, if because you know obviously money is, is of, of, of major concern, how are we gonna fund all this? Well, this is how, big money from big pharma. We know that Purdue Pharma and Johnson & Johnson, not Johnston, but Johnson & Johnson are the two primary high strength opiate providers not coincidentally, they're also the providers of the medications that cure and uh, fix, uh, prevent overdose. How does that work? So, so did they did they create a need for their medications? Did they 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 got people hooked on opioids, and now they're they're making medications to get people unhooked. So, so it doesn't make sense in in my mind. But court settlements as of May thirtieth, or excuse me, May third of this year, I counted up, is uh, $48.31 billion. As of July 21st, you can add another 26 billion on top of that. All combined estimate $74 billion. However, the problem is these companies are, are claiming bankruptcy. Um, and so they're getting, it doesn't really matter, they're getting ordered by the courts to pay all this money because when they go bankrupt, it, it wipes, wipes their debt. Off of this, off of the slate, so they get get away with it. And then the other problem is that historically, and we can see this with the tobacco industry and the lawsuits that happen with them, where money was allocated that was supposed to be for um, rehabilitation and so forth, but it didn't go to where it was, where it was supposed to go, and it ended up buying police uniforms and and a lot of things that many people argue are not exactly what it was designed for. Where am I at? 947. Okay, so let me get the second one going here. Uh, 
I think I'm gonna have to share the screen again. Yeah. Let's see, where are you? Stop share, start share. Okay, so um, all of this research culminated this summer in a fairly major project with Dr. Johnston and I, in which we wondered why, what is the problem? What's the holdup? Why, why don't we have these kind of sites? And, and what we figured that is that, that there's lots of different names that the sites are, are, are going under. And, they seem to change with the with the tides. So let me get the slideshow here. What we wanted to know is how how do we frame this? How do what what happens when we frame this in in various different ways? And and what we were trying to measure was the public support for safe consumption sites um, based on either one of several different variables. So. We, we framed, let's see, let me go. Um, like I said, how does framing impact public perception and support of a community harm reduction program? The harm reduction program I'm referring to is safe consumption site. And these are statistics. So the United States has now made its third wave of opioid epidemics costing thousands of lives. Yet not a single, until yet two days ago, government supported safe consumption site um, is available. These sites have been operating for more than 35 years in 12 different countries, outputting volumes, lots and lots. I mean, you know, the, the, I couldn't even touch over since 2019, I've really been digging in the, into this and I still just have barely touched the, the tip of the iceberg on this. And I'm, I'm, I live, I've literally gone over hundreds of reports and, and research papers. Some believe that a major contributing factor factor to the absence of safe consumption sites in America has to do with societal stigma, which I went over before, again, against people who use drugs. This research that Dr. Johnson and I performed expounds upon the notion that if overdose prevention programs are properly framed and presented to the public, the stigma can be overcome. Consequently, we can pave the way for more safe consumption sites and other harm reduction methods measures to become a staple throughout the United States, which FYI, they're not. They're very spotty in, in many places. And in fact, here in Grant County, we don't have hardly what you would find in a, a major metropolitan area. The research that we studied, this uh, research overview, um, I performed the initial literature review and evaluation of, of the findings and limitations of the prior research. The, the research question and preliminary hypotheses we developed, and then we designed, made a conceptual design of the study and presented it to the Institutional Review Board. Upon approval, uh, we fine-tuned some modifications and began recruiting participants. Then uh, during the focus groups, we planned on doing three audio recorded focus groups and an online focus group or an online survey is, is how it actually ended up. Uh, we collected the data, cleaned it, coded it, and it's still currently being analyzed. So uh, what, what I'm going over here are not final results. They're, they're just trends or um, speculations kind of as to, as to you know, where we're headed with this. Uh, the discussions, conclusions, limitations were notated and drafted, and we're in the process of putting together a peer review article for publication. The variables of the experiment, we have the controlled variables being the program name. So we have the safe consumption site, we have the overdose prevention site, the safe injection facility, and we added also harm reduction centers um, uh, after uh, Rhode Island legalized and under the name of harm reduction centers. We kind of wanted to know what the public would think of that as well. So the description of program, um, was also a variable. So we, we, we provided a small description of each program, the, the SCS, the OPP and the SIF. We associated images with each and 
they were all three were assigned an underlying theme. The overall framing uh, that was the independent variable. And that was either as promoting safety through safe consumption sites, saving lives through opioid or overdose prevention programs or scientifically proven safe injection facilities. So these are the three ways we, we framed uh, each presentation. The dependent variable was the degree of favorability measured on a Likert type scale. And then I think we use a, another scale in the, uh, the, the, the online survey as well as a Likert. I think it was a one to 10. We had four hypotheses we went into this with. And our first was that the overdose prevention program and safe consumption site packets would be rated more favorably than the supervised injection facility packets. Our second theory was that, our hypothesis rather, was that the overdose prevention packets would be rated highest among liberals and, uh, let's see, and people with uh, the most personal or familial history with opioids. This is, this is my theory just from my personal um, experience with, with addictions uh, throughout, throughout my life course. So then the third theory was safe consumption um, the, the safe consumption packets would be rated highest among conservative people um, and people with the least personal familial experience. And that was the, that was, we were basing that on, we figured that the more conservative people would be taking a more um, uh, safe approach, if you will. The focus groups, then we, we does, we figured that the focus groups, um, they would probably lean more towards the medical nature of, of these rather than safety and uh, scientific reasoning. The first phase, the focus groups came in four steps. The first step, we found in-person participants, they received a script, um, a verbal orientation and written informed consent was obtained. Then the second step, participants opened and reviewed a framing pack. And there was, that was followed by a 15 minute Q&A dialogue where they were able to discuss amongst themselves uh, what their thoughts were and, and get any sort of questions answered. We tried to stay as far in the woodworks as we could on this in order to not in any sort of way influence their, their decisions. Um, each focus group was randomly assigned a, a packet. So uh, that, that was the, random, the randomness that made it an experiment. The third step, uh, they, then we asked them to rate the degree of favorability on a scale of one to 100. And in the fourth step, uh, after steps two and three were completed, for all three packets, they submitted their ratings and, and participants were debriefed. Um, and if they needed any, if they, if they got triggered or, or, or in some way moved by, by the discussions, upset or anything like that, then we, we were there to offer support uh, for, for anyone that felt that way. Fortunately, nobody, nobody came out feeling like that. So it, it worked out good. Uh, the preparation for, for the first stage, first, we, well, Dr. Johnston and uh, the, our research assistant went to Grant County and well, went to the, uh, where was it? The farmer's market and the commons and the local democratic and Republican parties. And they solicited for, oh, at the, li the public libraries and they solicited for participants. So those covered a pretty wide swath of, of participants from Hispanic to a Caucasian, from young to old, we try to try to get everybody from as as wide a variety of people to have a, a fairly homogenous group um, participating in this. The focus groups, what we found was everybody in everybody uh, favored the overdose prevention programs above all else. So the overdose, uh, to, to refresh your memory, the overdose prevention programs were, I believe they were focused more on, um, what, what were they focused on? The, uh, I think it was health. 
uh, on saving lives. But they consistently rated the images more favorable than the, than the others, um, the other just names and descriptions for the for the OPPs and the SCSs. So, according to the chart, you can see the name is on the first column. Descriptions; those are the descriptions of each each packet, and then the images; those are the images, which I'll show you in a second. And then I combined all the statistics together for the final totals. So we had the OPP, the SIFs, and the SCSs. Um, participants favored the theme of saving lives above all else, uh, which to me, I, I wasn't entirely surprised, but I thought, I thought we would have more, more of a conservative group than we did. Um, the second phase, the online survey, also in four steps, similar steps. Participants read a briefing, um, and they signed off on a consent. It was uh, uh, through SurveyMonkey, so so it was all all pretty much uh, electronic, and they were able to do this in the uh, confines of of their own homes and and so forth. So it was is a is a very different setup than the first part. But what's important is that the results came back similar in both of them, despite the differences. Um, so in step in the second step. We have the, the program name description representing conceptual, conceptual uh, framings presented to the participants. Par participation. Oh, I got one minute. No, five. Par participants are asked to rate their degree again, just like the first one. And respondents, they were uh, queued to submit their answers, followed by a debriefing, very similar to the first one, except that it was done online. and the homogeny was 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 guaranteed by survey monkey and that's why we went with survey monkey because they offered they offered some guarantees that prevented people from retaking the the survey and um they they guaranteed uh fresh panelists and uh, so you know there's 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 a number of different things here that we, we chose survey monkey that kind of ancillary to the to the to, to this for for the purpose of this presentation, um, and I think yeah that so they monitor for survey bots. They routinely perform panel calibrations. They guarantee access to pools of more than ten million U.S. citizens. That all of those were appealing points. Survey Monkey came up with slightly different results. As far as the names concerned, the descriptions, images, and then all combined were similar to the focus groups. However, the names, I don't, I don't quite understand exactly why the names were still figure, figuring out why, the, why they didn't do, they, they didn't rate the names similarly. Uh, however, in this particular one, we added the harm reduction centers. Um, I didn't include that in the final totals because it wasn't, asked of our participants in the focus groups. So um, to, to keep, keep the results pure, I decided to go ahead and run my totals on just the, the OPP, the SIFs and the SCSs. Well, well, what I found interesting, particularly about the, the SurveyMonkey crowd was that 56% of the respondents um, felt that people turned to substance use due to stress and trauma. And we know that that is actually true, that trauma, child, especially childhood trauma, is a major contributor to, to um, risk factors for addiction. 50% uh, of the surveyors or the participants knew someone that had lost or nearly lost their lives to overdose. The majority had never witnessed any public injection of drugs. And 22% admitted to having had to seek emergency care for somebody they suspected was overdose. Roughly uh, equal amounts of men, men and women, and the age was about evenly divided at 60 years old. These are important because what we speculated was that people who had more interaction or, or more um, experience with, with opioid overdose and drugs and addiction would, would score differently. We, we, we figure they would score higher on, on, on OPPs, but, but it turns out that it didn't really matter if they did or didn't, they still score pretty fairly high. 
because most of the people in the focus group also scored high on OPPs, but they didn't have nearly the experience that's being conveyed here through SurveyMonkey. Here, are the, these are the images that were high, highest rated. In the top right corner, you can see that our main selling point was stop the spread of HIV. Obviously, uh, that's a medical issue. Then the statistic I told you about earlier, zero fatalities reported. Well, that was another, that's another health issue. And then thirdly, the OPPs, people more likely to get into recovery and OPP save lives. So all three of the highest rated images are directly pointed to saving lives. People weren't concerned about the scientific uh, background. They weren't concerned with, with the safety of their communities. They wanted to see lives safe. They wanted to see their families. They don't wanna see families die. They don't wanna see their members, their, their close loved ones die. Um, then here I combined all them together. The Harm Reduction Center, of course, I, I, I excluded from this graph temporarily until we could figure out how to incorporate that. Um, the overdose prevention programs, as we can see, all the focus groups and the surveys all scored very high on OPPs all combined. Everyone scored high on overdose prevention programs. Obviously, if we're gonna frame this to the public, then we should probably frame it as an overdose prevention program. And we should probably do it from the slant of it being a health consideration that can save lives. That's that's what you know. That's the that's the gist of this research that we have so far. Uh, however, I'm constantly reviewing all this in my mind, and and thinking of ways to change it and add and subtract and modify this research. So so I'm uh, trying to talk Dr. Johnston into doing a second round, <laughs> but I don't know if she'll be up to it or not. So we'll see. Um, again, like I pointed out earlier, this, these statistics are valid because the two, the phase A and the phase B were very different. One was quantitatively focused and the other was qualitatively focused. However, the results came back almost identical between both. And so in the realm of, of, of science, we, we would say that that's, uh, statistically valid because we were showing that the consistency between different variations. All right, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you do have one minute remaining. Okay, I'm almost done. So, and then the, my, my final conclusions, um, most of which I've already gone through. So, um, like I said, the House Bill 123 here in New Mexico, that was framed as an overdose prevention program, and that made it all the way to Senate before it died. And I suspect it was COVID-19 that had everyone distracted and that's why they didn't hear it. That it, it's not that it, was, it wasn't voted on, it just, or not that it was, not that it was, it lost in votes, but it just was never heard along with a lot of other bills that, that didn't get heard. So we'll try it again next year and next legislative session and see if we can get this, get things happening. Um, and that's about, that's all I got. Thank you so much. Um, a round of applause, applause for him. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Virtual applause. <laughs> Virtual, yeah. Tap your microphones. Thank you. Um, Scott, do we have time for, for questions, right? Yes, we have a little bit of time, yes. Okay. And, and I can ask a question. <laughs> Yeah, is it for me? <laughs> yeah, Brian, it is. Um, I, oh, no, I, I don't know if I'll answer it. Yeah, I, I know <laughs> that, you know, back in the day, uh, this methamphetamine didn't have fentanyl in it. Um, and I do know that people consume it in two ways, well, three ways, perhaps, but two ways would be, include injecting and smoking it. If there's mm -hmm. more and more fentanyl in this uh, drug, uh, does smoking it? Does it does that could that kill someone if it has if there's smoking speed that has fentanyl in it? We're not we're not entirely sure at the at the moment. I've looked into that very briefly because I was wondering if if you can even just smoke fentanyl. Um, and I believe if I recall the 
the residue that's left behind from fentanyl is very different than they, they are. That's what's encouraged. We, the idea is, hey, you know what? If you're going to use drugs, then come here. Because because if you're here, we can save you. We can't save you on the streets. We can't save you in an alleyway or a bathroom or anywhere. But if you're here and we see you going out, then we can give you the Narcan. We can do take, you know, do medical whatever we need to do, medically speaking, to, to revive the person and save your life. Thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a question. So uh, this uh, is, of course, a very important research topic. Uh, fentanyl is, of course, yeah, like you were saying, increasing in popularity in terms of being used to cut a, a variety of drugs. But what spurred your interest in it? Why did you, why did you jump on the project originally? Oh, well, uh, to be be quite honest, I have a, a lot of personal experience with addiction, and and uh, uh, let's see, this past October will be twelve years that I've had clean and sober, and so um, that alone is 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 enough to be the impetus for me to or stimulus to to pursue psychology and and drug and alcohol counseling. Um, so yeah, I've got a lot of a lot of uh, personal history with it. Uh, that that makes sense entirely. Um, I actually uh, recently a relative of mine passed away from fentanyl overdose. So uh, this is a, yeah incredible to see yeah. that it's being pursued. Yeah, and and I I'm a, I'm 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 pretty open about it because it's becoming something that is is very normalized in in society these days. So like yourself, you know, somebody, just about everybody knows somebody that, that is either struggling with addiction or has come close to death from overdosing. Yeah, the, uh, I appreciate all of your work. It's uh, profound. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Alrighty. Well, it is time to move on to our next presentation. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank um, you. Our next presenter, or our next presenter, is Joshua Sanchez in the history behind colonization of New Mexico. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to be presenting an essay that I wrote in my History 300 class with my professor um, Scott Fritz, and I'm just trying to figure out how I can upload it here. I got to um I got to allow Zoom to share my screen. I apologize. Okay, I hope everybody can see it here. Um, just gonna kind of, I have it pulled up just so we can see it and then just gonna kind of talk about it. Um, so, so this is just kind of the very beginning um, of how New Mexico just kind of established itself and the, the leaders or, or the, the, the people that kind of got us here. Um, uh, there, there, in the in the very beginning, um, you know, there was there, there was a lot of hardships and um, a lot of a lot of land that was traveled across just to kind of create the establishment through the harsh terrain and um, you know in, in the lands of New Mexico and and the and the mountainous terrain and and the dry desert. So it was kind of tough to kind of get to where we're at. 
Um, but what it came down to was, um, was a dream of seven cities of gold initially that were kind of just um, established from some of the local natives that have you know long lived here on uh, New Mexico or the, the Southwest region. Um, and this kind of got passed down to the Spaniards that were, um, that, that had uh, established themselves in, in Mexico at the time. So um, there was a gentleman by the name of Francisco Vasquez de Coronado, who um, he, he, wanted, he wanted to go see the seven cities of gold and he wanted to make that happen for, you know, for, him, for his family, for himself and for his, his, his country, um, you know, the new Spain, essentially. This, this became known as the Coronado Expedition. Um, and as he, as he um, developed this, um, this journey, he had to create um, opportunities with his, his self income and, and like, you know, the, the, the family, um, the family uh, inheritance that he had established and kind of use that to um, gather a group of, of individuals and uh, march across this treacherous land and, and look for the seven cities of gold. And as he, um, you know, as he approached it, there was some, some, some local natives that were there that um, kind of, kind of distracted him a little bit. And there was another gentleman that was with him that kind of, kind of ran ahead of him and, and said, you know, he saw some, some like kind of some, some light, I guess you would say, kind of glistening off the canyons, which to him appeared to be gold. Um, so that was, that was at the end of the day, that was what was reported back to Spain as they uh, made the march back to, you know, to, to uh, Spain to let them know, or, or Mexico as we know it. Um, so as the, as the report was um, laid out to the king, the, um, the seven cities of gold was, was there. It was very much alive and we needed to go after it. Um, so, you know, the king allowed him to gather even more people and, um, you know, just march across and start establishing a community and um, kind of taking over and expanding their lands uh, north. So as he, um, you know, as, as, he, as he gathered this, this bigger army, you, you could say, or, or these bigger families um, with him to go and make this community, he, you know, he ran across the local natives there and he had to, um, he had to go through many, 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 many battles, I would say, that kind of spread out his um, initial family or, or army that he had took with him. Because um, as I mentioned, the, the lands here are very kind of, kind of dry and, and, and treacherous a little bit, as, as, you know, as we know it. So his people kind of had to just establish themselves wherever they could. And as that happened, um, you know, throughout the short time they were there, the, the, you know, the, it was hard to, it was harder to communicate to them um, and, and get out whatever needed to be done to expand this community. Um, so as time went on, he, you know, he, he did his thing, you know, he, 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 he led what he, um, what he had took with him and he started building this community in, um, you know, in the Southwest region of, of the United States. Um, this is when Juan de Oñate kind of came into play and um, he, you know, he, he's, he's basically known as the, the founder of um, the Zeca, Zecatecas, um, which is a, the famous silver mining town. Um, and he, he married, um, let's see, married, uh, the granddaughter of Herman Cortez and, um, let's see, I kind of lost my train of thought there. I apologize. I get caught up here. Um, just going to read you a, a, a phrase here from the text. It says the frustrations on not experienced in this decade as governor were all foreshadowed by a series of unnerving events during the initial months of occupation um, during his ranks brought the first trouble. So, you know, it's just going to tell us that um, it, it was kind of tough for him to kind of bring that community together into Mexico and, and make that happen. Um, at the end of the day, the seven cities of gold was, it was false. Um, there, there wasn't any gold there 
it was it was just that that shining light off the canyon um so it it, it led to um greater opportunities in you know in establishing a um a bigger a bigger northern land for spain um they they were able to create transportation routes and work their way into um, Arizona and then eventually um, into California, which um, you know allowed uh, allowed our economy to build here within the United States. Um, so at the um, through, throughout it all, you know we're here today because um, these gentlemen, you know they um, they established themselves as forefront forefront runners and, and leaders and um and, and going after the unknown and uh they fought through you know the inevitable and they they made sure that um you know they they made a name for themselves and created uh new mexico as we know it today um but that that's kind of my essay on on how we created here on the colonization initially um and if you guys have any questions please feel free to ask me i'm all ears thank you for listening I get, can I ask a question? Oh, yes, sir. So uh, they, let me get this correct, I guess. Um, the, the Spaniards came here looking, looking for gold, but then they, they didn't find it and they were disappointed. And, and instead of turning it into a, a bad thing, they actually looked at it, viewed it as, 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 as a positive thing, regardless if there was gold or not. Oh, yes, sir. And yeah, yes, sir. That's a great way to put it. Um, essentially, that's exactly I, I find that I very, think. very admirable that, that they, they invested, they basically put everything, put, put everything into this coming for the gold and then to find there was no gold, but yet still continue to make, make a positive. I, I, I just think that's really, uh, really interesting. Yes, sir. And and the way that I um, kind of view it as is, is these gentlemen wanted to create something bigger for their family and, you know, for their people. And um, they use that as an opportunity to expand, you know, their 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 country at the same time. Yeah, it kind of makes me wonder if if their original intention was was really on gold or was it on the expansion and maybe the gold was secondary. Right. Yes, sir. You know what I mean? Yeah, that, yeah, that's exactly how I see it. You know, the gold was kind of a plus there to at the end of the day, they're going to get it back to their king. Um, I, I think they they had the understanding that they weren't going to see too much of that gold. But, you know, they were they were able to create a name for themselves and, and build something better for generations to come and kind of build that dynasty. That's interesting. I can appreciate that. Yes, sir. Good yeah. question. And I would add too is that there's this general interpretation of Spanish um, colonialism, which uh, would be the three G's. So you have uh, that the Spanish came to the Southwest for God, gold, and glory. So I think um, you're sort of arguing, uh, Joshua, that you know glory was a, a major reason why. Uh, Coronado and Oñate had come to New Mexico because they wanted to do something for their families and for their nation. I think that's something akin to glory. So, yes, well, sir. You. Yes, sir. Good call out. I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, I appreciate it, Joshua. Thanks. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Okay. I think as master of ceremony, I have to introduce now our student keynote speaker. Our student keynote speaker's name is Edward Mesquez. Edward Mesquez, he's a, a student in the Department of Natural Sciences. He's uh, pursuing a, bachel a Bachelor's of Arts in Forest Wildlife Management. And he's going to be uh, giving a talk titled An Adventure. So without further ado, let's uh, welcome uh, Edward Miskas. 
Good morning, everybody. I, I, uh, I'm thrilled to be here. I, I want to talk to you guys just about my experiences here at Western New Mexico University and outside Western New Mexico University in how immersed my life has been within natural sciences and the natural world and just appreciating everything that it has to offer. Um, I, I, I don't know how many of you know me or anything like that, but I, I pride myself in fully immersing my life in, in the outdoors here in the labs and, and uh, just to give you guys a little insight, I grew up on the banks of the Mimbris River, not far from, from here. Um, growing up, I was involved in a lot of ranching, hunting, fishing, and just plain outdoor activities. And as I, as I really, really progressed in ranching, hunting, fishing, hiking, being outdoors, I grew more and more interested in looking at where that could take me in life. I always had a little library collection of field guides and books on plants, reptiles, and, and everything like that. So as I progressed, my grandfather would take me out, show me what plants along the river you could use for medicines or what plants were vital to the river's sustainability and, and things like that. As I would go hunting, my father would show me good game management practices in uh, harvesting older animals that had already contributed to the gene pool and understanding the feeding habits and other things of animals and the pretty much the entire ecology uh, here on the Gila. And, and that was just my, my young life. That was just growing up. That was uh, enjoying the natural world and being immersed in the natural world through my family, through, through a lot of my uh, role models, like my grandfather's and my father. Um, as, I, as I progressed and got older, I developed a passion for natural sciences and, and wanting to understand more deeply the ecology, especially here on the Gila. I, I have a passion here on the Gila. I'm, I'm, in the summers, I'm employed with the U.S. Forest Service on an engine crew to fight wild land, or wildfires. Um, right here on the Silver City District of the Gila National Forest. This place is near and dear to my heart. So bringing it all together, I came here to Western New Mexico University in the spring of 2018. And when I came here, I was a little skeptical on, on if this degree was the right degree for me and if I was fully going to be immersed and passionate and fulfilled within, within this degree of forest wildlife science and uh, my minor of criminal justice. Little did I know that as I progressed, I would fall more and more in love with it as I, I uh, really honed in on my love for reptiles and plants through Dr. Jennings herpetology classes and Dr. Norris and Dr. Kleinman's plant classes, dendrology and plant taxonomy, um, as well as range vegetation. So all those classes, as I took them, I tied everything in that I learned in those classes, such as range management and range uh, plant, like range grass identification and woody shrub identification and things like that. Uh, I tied that all in with my uh, ranching background, my hunting background, my fishing and hiking and, and kind of just, I always saw myself as a, as a steward for some of the places I grew up in. And so taking those classes and tying all the things that I learned in those classes with the life outside really solidified my decision on just where I needed to be, especially within the natural sciences department and life outside. Um, Outside of, outside of the natural sciences, I, I have been four summers with the U.S. Forest Service here at the, in the Gila National Forest. Um, as I progressed with those firefighting efforts, I 
also integrate the dendrology, the ecology that I learned from Dr. Norris and the research that we have kind of done in those classes where we're looking at identifying trees and other plants and, and uh, just the, the big grand scheme of the ecology, especially here on the Gila where Dr. Norris, Dr. Kleinman and, and a lot of the other professors here in, in the natural sciences department really emphasize on local, local ecology and local identification. So not only does it help me in my firefighting efforts, it helps me outside as I hunt fish and just just enjoy the Gila and everything that the Gila has to offer. Um, in in a grand scheme of the things that I do for the Forest Service, not only is it firefighting, but we also do um, wildland urban interface thinning. We do a lot of other thinning projects, which all tie into the benefit of the ecology, especially the local ecology here in the Gila. Um, we do wildlife management projects such as uh, water catchments and things like that, whereas we do we also do a lot of prescribed burning and the prescribed burning adds a lot of nutrients back into the forest and it, and it provides a lot of new habitats uh, for any any of the organisms uh, running around out there on the Gila. So as we do those things and as I progress, even in the agency, I tie all of that back here to what I've learned at Western and understand the importance from the importance of that work and the importance of my life growing up and and seeing the Gila and being fully immersed in the Gila with with those things. Um, it, I, I also do a lot of photography. My photography you can see back here. I chose Willow Creek, a location on the northern end of the Gila National Forest. Uh, that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, I do a lot of photography and through that photography, I get to really, really enjoy the full scope of the natural world, taking pictures of organisms, birds, plants, uh, mammals, reptiles, and, and my firefighting experiences and my hunting and fishing and hiking experiences. So if you guys, if any of you in the audience are, are interested in, in following me along in that journey, I, I have Instagram and Twitter where I share everything that I do. I share all the places that I, that I, uh, that I enjoy and I, and I try and make it as, as beautiful as possible where it's, it's already beautiful. So um, with that, in conclusion, the time that I have spent here in Western has definitely solidified uh, my passion for the natural world and, and definitely set forth a future where I, I would like to continue being a steward of the natural world and natural sciences and, uh, and follow that to wherever, wherever it'll, it'll take me. So with that, I'll, I'll conclude. And, and if anybody has any questions as to some of the things I do outside um, of school or within school, I, I would love to love to hear them. Okay, let's open it up for questions and comments. So anyone out there have a comment or question for uh, Edward Mesquez? Because I, I, I do have uh, some comments. Maybe that'll help generate some other yeah, I was, I was going to take a guess that that's Willow Creek. <laughs> yep, and that's the, that's Willow Creek. And the reason why is that that's some of the best fly fishing I've ever done up in the Gila. Indeed. I remember that one time back about 10 years ago before that big fire in that area. Boy, I bet I think I caught about 60 trout. I mean, they're small. Yes, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, just on a little caddis pattern. Um, I'm sort of wondering, um, after that fire, I think it impacted the Gila trout population up there. Um, so what's the Gila trout population looking like up there at, uh, in Willow Creek right now? In Willow Creek right now, so far as I've been up there, it's still a little up and down, just depending on, on the stream flow and how everything works in there. I know that in recent years, the Forest Service, uh, especially the Wilderness Ranger District, has, has devoted a lot of effort into 
packing in a uh, small fry and removing some of the invasive species within those streams just to make room for the Gila trout and to establish a, a stronger Gila trout population. But I know as of right now that the Gila trout population up there is, is still pretty strong in some places, but maybe not as, as much as we'd hope for, for uh, 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 like fly fishing as it used to be, I guess, yeah. <laughs> or Gila trout populations as they used to be. Yeah, you know, I've hooked in some, caught some big Gila trout, I mean, almost mm -hmm. 12 inches, and that's pretty big for a Gila trout, I'd say. And I, uh, and I think that's the grand overview of, of efforts on the Gila is to bring a lot of those native species like the Mexican gray wolf, the Gila yeah. trout back in and kind of just establish the, the wilderness as, as a very, very pure wilderness. So, yeah. I, I see a lot of that, especially working with the agency. There's there's a lot of effort being made. Yeah, yeah. Okay, very good. It looks like we might have uh, another person. Uh, Brian, looks like you just appeared on. <laughs> you have a question? <laughs> this is all so interesting. I, I just can't help myself. Um, that I I wanted to ask you. Uh, did you uh, did you ever end up taking a, a historical geology class? I have not, but that that is definitely on the docket for for things. yeah I, I was just gonna ask you because because that was something i got really interested in was the fact that there's uh shells there's seashells up here in the mountains <laughs> yeah yeah definitely there there's a lot of geology especially around the santa rita mine area georgetown area and uh, we've, we've actually taken some sort of interest when I was taking invertebrate zoology with Dr. Jost. And uh, we, we looked into that a tiny bit, but yeah, it, the geology here in the Gila is another thing that I think maybe gets neglected a little bit. Yeah, I just never really knew how old the, the lava rocks were until, until I took that class. It gets fascinating. Indeed. Uh, it looks like we got a question that was asked. Um, is there any news on bring back otters? So is um, that otters I, I or beaver? I haven't heard anything about bringing bringing otters back or or anything. I know that they have made some efforts to establish uh, beavers, especially around the the upper uh, the northern half of the Gila, like uh, Snow Lake and and the Gilitha drainages and the Iron Creek drainages, where beavers can kind of establish that natural stream presence and stuff. So I don't think it would be completely out of the question that otters might might head back into into the natural ecology of the Gila. Yeah, okay. So I don't know who asked that question, but I noticed it on the chat box. Yeah, I think it was on the Gilita, on Gilita Creek. That's where I was doing really well two years back. And if I remember, I would, what I'd do is I, I'd hike, I'd, I'd sneak up to those uh, beaver ponds. <laughs> yep, yep. And then as I'm going upstream, and then just sort of just toss that little caddis pattern, boom. There you go. Yeah, that, left that's and the right. way to do it. Uh, any other comments or questions for uh, Edward? I have a comment, well, more of an observation, but a no, question as well. Um, I just want to just say that I love <laughs> your passion that you have for your um, your degree and just how everything like your life and like your upbringing like affected how passionate you are for it and like, like the fact that you're performing your presentation outside without any breeze that shows me how passionate you are too that's amazing. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, I have one little question for you. Um, you did say you are also majoring in um, criminal justice? Yes, criminal okay. justice. And are you still thinking of pursuing both of them or are you leaning more towards this one? I, I lean more towards the natural sciences, but I also lean more towards immersing myself in a little bit of both mm -hmm. and maybe pursuing something within the lines of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, maybe law enforcement or uh, New Mexico Department of Game and Fish uh, law enforcement. So I, I, uh, I'm up for debate on, on some of the routes I want to go and, and some of the things I want to do, but I guess that's the excitement in it. <laughs> okay, awesome. All right, thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Okay, uh, any, any other thoughts, comments? We've got about 
five minutes before our next presentation. Hey, um, hi, Dr. Fritz. It's Sally. Go, uh, go for it, Sarah, or Sally. Go for it, Sally. I Sarah. just wanted to, what, once I heard that Edward was interested in maybe being a future um, law enforcement with the Forest Service, um, do, you just better make sure you have your fishing license every time you're out there. <laughs> of course, out. always. I always do. I always do. <laughs> I think he's fishing right now. He's out there. <laughs> And it and just just to to if anybody wants to go and, and check out some of the things I that I put on Instagram, uh, if you have a pen and paper or just a good memory, my uh, Instagram username or I shouldn't say username, my my handle is miskes m i s q u e z underscore outdoor underscore photo, and I'm always posting. So something, either my hunting adventures or fishing adventures or hiking or just travel in general. So if anyone is interested and, and feel free to shoot me questions after this or, or send me a message there on Instagram and I, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions I about anything that I do, especially with the Forest Service or, or things like that. Uh, Bill, uh, Dr. Norris, go ahead. Bill's good enough. So I'd like to share one of my most vivid memories of that uh, good but long academic year last year when everything was online. And Eddie had, uh, maybe it was ornithology. Um, I had the privilege of seeing Eddie zoom in. He had his cell phone mounted in the front of his pickup truck. I think he was driving over Highway 152 in the Black Range attending class while going down the highway. You remember that, Eddie? <laughs> yes, sir, I do. Yes, sir. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm always out there, and I, and I try and get to class, too, on time. <laughs> yeah, and you were there on time, and uh, I thought I, I've been in this business for 31 years. I thought I'd seen everything. Well, <laughs> I've not seen everything. So uh, are you actually, I, I'm being a little bit of a smart aleck here, that's the actual background right there. You've got your laptop set up with all those nice fir and spruce and down here in willow creek <laughs> blue spruce and and uh <laughs> some willows in the creek and you know yeah. you taught me all that you tell I me love all it. that bill <laughs> okay i wanted to share that anecdote any sending class via cell phone going over the black range <laughs> <laughs> thank you, bill. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> thanks a lot eddie <laughs> you got it so you know i can see why you titled your presentation ed adventure you have uh found you already know what your passion is in life and you've just made that your academic career yes and yes indeed yeah and i think uh, that's a great testimony it's a great example for others to follow yes yes, um, yes. yeah i um, always found history interesting and so i i followed that passion um now that i'm getting older i have another passion called music i like to play guitar and so i'm Almost thinking about seeing about pursuing a minor in music before I, before <laughs> I retire. Perfect. Yeah. I, I I always say it's never never too late. Yeah. <laughs> I I was talking to my 86 year old grandma who hadn't finished credits here at Western, and we actually got into the conversation. Well, this was before it was it was Western High School at the time, but oh, yeah. she was taking credits here. And uh, we got into the topic of finishing that and both of us finishing next year. And she is 86 years old, so yeah. <laughs> it is never too late. That's okay, great. thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other last minute uh, comments for the good of the group? I do have one thing that I'd like to say is- Go um, for it. I follow Eddie on Instagram and I really encourage you guys to go look at his photography. Some of the pictures that he takes are just amazing. Thank I know you. that I think um, this past summer he was in Montana, correct? Montana fighting fire, yes, yes. And some of the, the pictures that he was able to take today were just breathtaking. So I really, if you do have Instagram, even if you don't, create an account and just go out and check those pictures out. Thank you, I, I appreciate that. Okay, any last, last minute thoughts, comments? Well, uh, thanks once again, uh, uh, Eddie. Sure. Appreciate appreciate your, your keynote address. Thank you, guys. So I'm going to turn this back now to, is it going to be Taylor or Cassia?
Katya? Okay. So Thank Katya you. will continue moderating our presentations. All right. So next up, we got um, Cultivating a Growth Mindset by Wendy Vance. Vance? Vance. Vance. Oh, yes. <laughs> I have an habit of mispronouncing everything that I said. That's say. totally okay. <laughs> Are you ready? I'm ready. Yeah. All right. Let's go. Okay. So I um, just want to tell you a little bit about myself and then I'm going to share um, a, a condensed version of a PowerPoint that I presented in October. Uh, so uh, the beauty of Zoom, I'm actually Zooming in from the East Coast. I live right outside of Philadelphia. Um, and so it's been uh, an honor to uh, hear and see the beautiful uh, area uh, of Western. So uh, I have a master's in higher ed counseling and I'm here at Western. I started um, summer one in the uh, graduate certificate program for psychology. So um, I am really excited to bring this presentation to you. So if you give me a second, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so as I um, mentioned, um, this is a condensed version of a workshop that uh, was actually the result of a final project that I completed in, in a certification uh, course that I completed in September. Uh, so in January of this year, I started a, a program that is um, primarily uh, based on providing uh, positive psychology certifications in, in several different fields. So uh, I decided to do their nine month program in applied positive psychology, which um, since graduation, I'm a, officially a practitioner. As a result of this, uh, the culmination of this program, I had to do a final project. And so I decided to do, uh, set up a, a group meetup. So I'm, I'm probably sure you've heard of meetup and, and I'm assuming you've had, you have meetup in your location. So what I decided to do was, was organize a meetup see what that response was going to be. And, and again, it's, it's virtual right now. And it was really overwhelming. I wanted to focus on uh, providing a positive psychology workshops to women, uh, BIPOC women in particular. And a BIPOC, for those of you who don't know, means uh, Black Indigenous people of color. So, uh, my group right now, I have, I, I uh, organized the group in August. And as of today, I have 225 members, which is truly amazing. And of all different women, all different ages, backgrounds, ethnicities, uh, and even locations. Uh, primarily the members are coming from, of course, the East Coast, uh, New Jersey, New York, Philadelphia, you know, Pennsylvania, Delaware, but I do have a few members that are in other parts of the country because it is virtual and even uh, a couple of women that are in Canada. So that um, really has made it a, a global community uh, that um, where I have a platform to share positive psychology. So some of you, and I'm going to, um, see. Okay, so I'm going to just uh, take my video off so that you can see the, uh, 
the, the PowerPoint. So for those of you who aren't as familiar with positive psychology, it is a branch in psychology. It's, it's a fairly uh, newer branch um, and it focuses on a, a model of flourishing. So it's looking at the individual and building what is right um, about that person. Oh, okay, so, yes, Dr. Coleman, yes, that sounds great. So it is about um, what's building what's right and not just fixing what's wrong. Uh, the study of the, the total person, it follows the wellness model. Uh, so one of the founders um, has a, a saying that says, you know, bringing people north of neutral, which means many of us are doing okay. You know, um, we're doing fine. We don't necessarily have uh, any diagnoses or things like that, but we're just doing okay. Positive psychology has done a lot of research and in the areas of what can bring us from just doing okay to truly flourishing. So the model uh, that I have here, this graphic, uh, and it looks like to me, it's a flower. And in the center cap, that's the program, a certification program I went through. And there are these, these petals around this flower, uh, positivity, engagement, relationships, meaning, achievement, and vitality. Uh, and vitality also, you see it's wellness, strong body. Uh, it also includes positive sexuality and, and vitality as well. So this uh, workshop, Cultivating Your Growth Mindset, falls under that positivity petal optimism, happiness, life satisfaction. These were the learning ob objectives that I uh, focused on with the group of women who attended uh, this workshop. Understanding what mindsets are, how they're formed, a lot, helping them to distinguish between the fixed and the growth mindset, uh, understanding how self-fulfilling prophecies tie into those mindsets. And, and I'll show you that in a few minutes. Uh, of course, understanding the research that supports uh, the mindset theory under positive psychology, um, the impact of mindset on positivity, health, success, and so much more. And um, the women got to do some interaction with each other, uh, learning to spot mindsets, not only in, the, in themselves, but also in others. So what is a mindset? So here is the official definition, set of beliefs, way of thinking that determines your behavior, your outlook, your mental attitude. So according to mindset theory, and this was pioneered by psychologist Carol Dweck, uh, essentially she's found through her research that people who have, and even children, so adults and children who have a growth mindset are more likely to experience success in academics, in re their relationships, in the workplace, um, so, so many beneficial things come from just a switch in, in that mindset. And I'm going to hopefully by the end, you'll get a, a better idea of what the mindsets are, spotting them in yourselves, and then being able to move from a fix to a growth mindset. Here's a mind, and I'll put this in the, uh, the chat once I uh, finish with the, with the presentation, but there is a great free mindset quiz. There's only eight questions. And uh, once you answer these questions, you'll be able to get personalized feedback based on your results and, and determining your mindset. So I, I encourage you to take that uh, sometime today. So let's look at these two different mindsets. The fixed mindset. People who tend towards the fixed mindset basically are going to believe that their abilities are set, they're established, they're stable, they don't change. 
Uh, I like to think of it as you either have it or you don't, all right? Um, social psychologist David Dunning has done some research as well into this and fixed mindset is really one of the least accurate. When you compare the two, um, those who tend towards that fixed mindset either overestimate or underestimate their own ability. So it's, it's really not uh, a, a mindset that is going to give you a true, uh, uh, you know, accurate analysis of, of what your real potential is. So here is, and I'm going to look at this from, from both mindsets. Uh, this is a, a business or a selling example. And I hope that this gives you an idea of how the, the thoughts can actually lead to the behaviors. So here you see this belief, this thought, I'm a bad salesperson, all right? Fixed mindset. So then stemming from that belief will be the behavior that person will then give up trying to improve their sales because it's something where they believe either they're good at it or they're not good at it. And then the result is going to be the lack of sales, all right? So that belief to the behavior, to the result. And then it, it's, it's this self-fulfilling prophecy because then the result of the lack of sales then leads that person right back to oh, okay, I am a bad salesperson. So there, there's this hamster wheel that um, you can find yourself on and this self-fulfilling prophecy of the belief which is linking to the results which, bring, which can bring you back to that, that same essential belief. Another example of this fixed mindset shows up oftentimes when we deal with failure. Um, you know, we all know that life is full of challenges and ups and downs, and there are going to be times where things just don't go the way we had hoped. When you look at things from a fixed mindset and, and say, I'm a failure, which is again, a character trait that can really bring you down, cause you to feel depressed, cause you to feel uh, unmotivated. So it's healthier and leaning more over to the, the growth mindset to say, well, hey, I may have failed at this, but I'm not a failure. So you're really looking at it as a, through the growth mindset lens, you're attaching uh, the failure to a specific event or situation and not to who you are. So when you do that and make that switch, it's building resilience, it's creating that positive loop and that positive self-fulfilling prophecy. So I've, as I've alluded to, um, this growth mindset and people who tend towards it, believe that they can learn, believe that they can grow. If you invest enough time and, and effort, you're going to improve in, in some way. And so that's that, that belief and that positive belief that you can learn, you can, mindsets can be changed, you can grow, you can take on those challenges. So let's look at how, going back to this selling, how different it looks with just what you're saying to yourself. So here, growth mindset, you believe selling is a skill set, which means it's something that you can improve upon. Behavior, because you believe it's a skill set, you're going to practice, you're gonna learn those skills to get better. Maybe you will buy books on selling and read books. Maybe you will watch some YouTube videos on how to be a better seller. Maybe you will um, talk to and, and look around and talk to people that are doing well selling and see if you can get some hints and ideas and, and mentorship from those people. So you're doing those kinds of things. That's the kind of behavior that will support this skill set belief. And then the result Generally, you'll get more sales as you spend more time working at it and you spend more practice 
working at it. So you can see, again, this self-fulfilling prophecy is going to be this positive loop. As you get more sales, that's going back to your belief. Oh, wow. So selling, selling is a skill set. I've put all this work in and I'm actually getting better results as time goes on. I wanted to share this reflection and um, I had the, the, the group of women in this workshop uh, do a free write where they took a little bit of time to think about what areas of their life did they have the fixed mindset from and how did that come to be? And then what areas of their lives did they have the growth mindset and how did that come to be? So, you know, typically we are not um, all or nothing. We are all complex human beings. So we may tend towards fixed mindsets in certain areas, but not in others. And the women had a, uh, a good opportunity to really um, reflect and delve on in that, in their, those areas of their lives that, that this manifested. And then we came together in the, the full Zoom uh, group and there was uh, a good, um, good amount of bonding and sharing and discovering about those areas that they uh, experienced um, some of these differences in their mindset. How can you go about changing your mindset? So these are really quick ways that you can start to change that fixed mindset to more of a growth mindset. I like to call the first one, the power of yet. That uh, three letter word is so small, but it can really change your outlook. So fixed mindset, I can't do this. Growth mindset, I can't do this yet. That opens up a lot of possibilities there. Second one, well, hey, this didn't work. Fixed. Growth, what else can I try? And then the last one, oh, these people are better than me. They, they got an A on this exam and I didn't. Well, what can they teach me? What can I learn from them? So by asking, by adding yet, by asking some questions, you can easily move from that fixed way of looking at things to that growth mindset. This is an example of uh, some of the questions that the women uh, got to practice with each other in the breakout room uh, to determine and whether- I'm sorry to interrupt, but you do have yes. one minute remaining. Okay, yeah, almost done. All right, awesome, thank you. So they got to look at each, some of these statements in their breakouts and then come together and we uh, looked at what was fixed and what was growth. So this is my last slide. This is the book that um, if you are interested in learning more about mindset um, from Carol Dweck, The New Psychology of Success. And uh, as you look at these 10 tips, uh, that I have left you with, I hope that you'll start to think about how fixed mindset shows up for you and start to challenge yourself to think more uh, in the growth mindset. And I appreciate uh, the, uh, you taking the time to listen to my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. A round of virtual applause, please. <laughs> <laughs> now we have some time for comments and questions I actually I do have a comment um will you mind posting that link for the um yes for the, the uh yes yes sure yes. definitely on the yes. chat please thank yes. you sure do we have any other questions yeah, I have a question. Uh, yes. Yeah, what does flow experiences mean? Yeah, um, flow experience, it's amazing. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So, so flow experiences and, um, you know, it, it's going to be individual for each person. You know, the best way to explain it is when you're in the zone. 
So I know uh, earlier you mentioned um, possibly you're being into music. And, and yes, yeah, so music, oftentimes, if you're playing music, you're in the zone. It's almost like time stops. So that's a flow experience. And so because we're all different, it's going to be different for all of us. And so the key is to uh, make sure you're incorporating as many flow experiences as you can, even in your work. So there's, there's a lot of um, you know, research in how flow experiences contribute to uh, just you know, a positive outlook and optimism and well-being and all of those good things. Yep, that's what I thought. That was good. Yes, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so yes, keep, keep playing. Yeah, I will. Yeah. I will yeah. I'll get the fam back together. <laughs> yes, <et cetera>. yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank You're you. You're welcome. I have a comment. Um, thank you so much for your presentation, first of all. Um, thank you. I, I, um, I work over in the School of Business now, but um, before I came back to Silver City, I was a kindergarten teacher for 15 years, worked with many, many children. Um, and I do remember from a developmental psychology class learning about the self-fulfilling prophecy. And then after that, working with children, I, it's, it's like, it was so amazing to know that, to understand that especially children that didn't feel good about themselves and they're five years old and they're already starting to feel some of these yes. things, which is sad yeah. and, and and they have to be pushed into a positive direction right away and yes. into believing themselves and it's it just it is amazing that it works and yeah it's very true. It, it is it is and and what i'd like to add with that is that um you know knowing knowing that loop that that i was showing so it's often especially with with kids because they may not have the language around what's going on, but seeing the behavior of maybe giving up on something or being frustrated about something can, can give you clues to what is the belief that they're having. So, so you know, what you're saying is, is really just really spot on. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I was curious. Um, you didn't mention Martin Seligman. wasn't Wasn't he the the positive psych guy? He is. He is, and he is the positive psych guy. And um, a lot of the uh, it, and so I feel very fortunate. I'm right outside of Philadelphia, and a lot of that work and um, is is right in my neighborhood at the University of Penn. Yeah, I noticed. Yeah, yeah he's out, yeah. he's out of U U Penn. Do you, do, you ever, yeah. do you ever go down to the Kensington area? Uh, it's been a while because of, you know, the, the pandemic, but it's, it's interesting because a lot of what uh, your presentation was about, my daughter um, had to go in, she went to Temple, uh, she's graduated now six years, but she had to go into Kensington, she was a journalism major and had to go in and do a final project on everything that was going on in the uh, you know, the, 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 the area of addiction and all of that. So yeah, yes, yeah. <laughs> I'm very familiar with it, yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of transplanting myself there when I finish my degrees. Oh, wow, all right. Well, then you gotta keep in touch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you for thank your, you. your presentation. Oh, you. it was, I, I enjoyed it. Oh, thank you very much, Brian. Any other questions? All righty. Well, thank you so much, Wendy. Oh, you're I'll welcome. Take it. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm oh, going to go ahead and, and put the, uh, I'll put that in the, the chat, that assessment. All right. Thanks. So Taylor, take us there. All righty. So our next presentation or presenters is a group, and I do apologize if I butcher the title or any names. I was practicing a little bit um, a while ago to try and get the names correct, but I, I really do apologize. Um, so the title of this presentation is Predominance of Wallobicha Hippotenus and Massopora Cicading in magic cicada casting captured in the Southwest Ohio area. 
Um, the presenters are Ab uh, Abigail Grotto, Eric Granillo, uh, Rula Ishka, Marlene Mos Mosqueda, and Jay Arza Nickel. <laughs> Hello, um, this is the student group that prepared the research presentation. Um, we submitted a video. Are, are you able to show that video or did you want them to just talk about their findings? I don't believe, uh, let me see if I can find the video. I um, don't have access to it right on the PowerPoint that I'm reading off of, so let me find it. Yeah, I can it, chat you the YouTube link if that would be. Yeah, that would work. Okay. okay. <laughs> it's in with the other video submissions on the Canvas oh. page. Yeah, so go okay. to the Canvas, go to the sort of the last mo last pages of the module for the last. I think I can. Um, okay, oh wait, I think I can get to it now. Let's see, okay, I can get to it. So one moment, I'm almost there. Um, and they would love to answer questions after the video. Oh, wait, I'm in the old one. Okay, I think I'm getting there. Um, let's see. Yeah, I don't, I don't see it here. Um, I think it may just be easier to, to get the YouTube link. Yeah, let's do it that way. All right, let me pass that to you in the chat here. Okay. You got that, Taylor, or do you want me to display it? I can do it. Okay. Sorry, I'm looking here on YouTube. <laughs> Let's pull that up for you. Yes. Oh yeah, that's right. Good idea, guys. So oh, there it is. Okay, great. Let me. All right. Okay. Let me share this. Copy the link. Back to the Zoom. Sorry about this delay. And paste. There's no hurry. You can take your time. Oh, thank you so much. All right, I chatted the link there. I have I uh, I have the video pulled up. Great. And you know how to turn on the audio when you're sharing a screen on Zoom? I believe so. Okay. Um, awesome. Thank you. Let me. Okay. I'll start playing the video. And if there are um, any issues with the sound, just let me know. Awesome, thank you. Watcher Vivientes and Masospora Sequedina and Magisiquera Cassini captured in the Southwest Ohio area. This research was done by Abigail Grotto, Aira Granillo, Rula Ishak, Marlene Mosqueda, and Jay Arsenico. 
sponsored by the Western New Mexico University and Deming Early College High School. Figure one shows a magisticated cassini, and figure two shows an insect cell infected with Wolbachia pipientis. Research questions. Question number one. What percentage of food X matches cicada cassini cicadas are infected with, with Wolbachia pipientis, a rickettsial bacteria that is changing the sex ratio of the insect population? Figure three, again, shows an insect cell infected with Wolbachia pipientis. However, this cell is stained and therefore looks different from the previous one. Question number two. What percentage of food X matches cicada cassini cicadas are infected with Nasospora sinidina, a pathogenic fungus in the class of Entomopleuromyces? Figure four shows cicada infected with stage two Nasospora sinidina. And question number three Is there any difference in the gender infection rates? Abstract. 71 Magisicada Cassinis were captured from the Southwest Ohio area. Magisicada Cassinis are periodical cicadas and they previously emerged 17 years ago. All specimens were tested for Wolbachia pipientis and Massospora cicadina. Identification for Wolbachia pipientis was based on the 16S gene of RDNA, which is the gene for rRNA in the large segment of the bacterial ribosome. Therefore, the gene is only in Wolbachia and not the insect gene. The gene used for insect DNA identification was the cytochrome C oxidase gene, which is part of the electron transfer chain in aerobic respiration. Being Swobachia goes through anaerobic respiration, the gene is only in the cicada genome. Swobachia is a rickettsial bacteria that is primarily transmitted vertically, which is from mother to offspring. However, horizontal transmission can occur. Since the Magisicada Cassini X were late 17 years ago, the infection rate should be consistent with the general insect infection rate from 2004. Nasospora cicadina is a pathogenic fungus in the class of Entomopleuromyces, and it only infects periodical cicadas. Figure 5 shows a periodical cicada, the Magisicada Cassini. Because Magisicada Cassinis fluctuate between the 13 and 17 years, These organisms have been understudied due to their infrequent emergence. In the following map, we see where the cicadas were collected, which is between the states of Indiana, Ohio, and Kentucky, and more specifically in those little boxes. In table one, we see the exact locations of the captured sites. Magic cicada can see. Magisicida cassini are one of the three periodical cicadas that fluctuate between a 13 and a 17 year cycle, and the last time they emerged was 2004. They go through an incomplete metamorphosis, egg, nithin, or dope, and as we see in page six, that's a cicada name. Here, those made in vegetation where the female of deposits in twigs. After several weeks, the eggs will hatch for them, will fall to the ground and bury themselves for 13 or 17 years. The, the nymphs spit on nutrient poor xylem, and xylem is the vascular system in plants where they, uh, it's from the roots of the plants to the top. The nymphs build on waterproof tunnels where they will feed on the xylem of the roots of the plants. Ecological benefits. Poor sources for many animals increases, such as small mammals, insects, spiders, and reptiles. Periodical emergence of cicada produces an increase of a biomass in an area. Ecological harms. Damage to trees from over precision, which, which kills the tissue and allows the plant pathogens to infect the host. As we see in figure seven, which is the tree damage from a cicada over precision, which is from female laying eggs. From the spitting on the xylem, which also kills the tissue and allows the plant pathogens to infect the host. Wolbachia, the reproductive manipulator, and the consequences of Wolbachia infestation. Wolbachia rickettsial alpha-proteobacteria endosynthesis can be parasitic and mutualistic. 
Wabaki tends to be parasitic when one organism is harmed while the other one is helped. Wabaki can also cause cytoplasmic incompatibility, which is the inability to produce offsprings, feminization, parthenogenesis, sterility, and a shorter lifespan among arthropods. Wabaki modifies the host's reproductive system in order to enhance its own growth. 67% of all insects are infected with Wolbachia, which is a 50% increase since 1997. Their infection rate is increasing at approximately 2% each year. In figure eight, we see a magisketa cassini that has been infected with Wolbachia. Wolbachia also helps block many diseases and viruses that are transmitted through insects, such as mosquitoes. When an insect is infected with Wolbachia, there is a decline in other infections, such as the Zika virus, the dengue virus, the soft Lassie virus, West Nile virus, malaria, yellow fever, and many more. Cytoplasmic incompatibility. There are two types of cytoplasmic incompatibility. In the unidirectional cytoplasmic incompatibility, if the male is infected with Wolbachia and the female is not, then they cannot produce an offspring. However, in the bidirectional cytoplasmic incompatibility, Wolbachia infected insects can only produce an offspring if they share the same strain of Wolbachia. If the male has a different strain of, of Wolbachia than the female, then they cannot produce an offspring. Feminization. In feminization, Wolbachia manipulates the DNA of male insects, arthropods, and nematodes, influencing the cells to produce ovaries and secrete estrogen. Additionally, Wolbachia can completely feminize male arthropods and nematodes into fully functioning females. Subsequently, the manipulation of the organisms of reproductive systems is skewing the male-female sex ratio of the populations and decreasing their genes. Figure 10 displays the genitalia of Mesocetum cassini. On the left, we have the female genitalia, and on the right, we have the male. Figure 11 displays the male timbal, a sound producing structure found only on males. This proved quite useful when identifying the sex of our cicadas. Parthenogenesis. Parthenogenesis is the reproduction of an unfertilized ovum which produces only females. Males cannot transmit Wolbachia. In parthenogenesis, females are produced, increasing transmission of Wolbachia. However, the sperm of infected males swim faster than those not infected, giving Wolbachia a distinct advantage. Parthenogenesis has only been naturally found in haplodiploid insects such as the honeybee, as displayed in figure 12. In these insects, diploidy is restored by non-distinction of the chromatids in the mitotic anaphase stage. All offspring resulting from parthenogenesis will be female and infected with Wolbachia. Transmission of Wolbachia pipiensis. Transmission is a transfer or a passageway for bacteria and viruses to infect another organism. Wolbachia can be transmitted through two types of transmission, horizontal or vertical. Horizontal transmission occurs through the consumption of an infected organism through either cannibalism or food supply. Vert uh, vertical transmission occurs between her mother and offspring. Again, males cannot transfer Wolbachia. Figure 13 displays horizontal transmission, and figure 14 displays vertical. Massasporia cicatina is a sexually transmitted disease that can only infect the population of radical cicatas, and it affects both females and males. In stage one, one of the early stages of the disease, infected cicatas will reduce Haploid cutigia spores still facilitate the transmission to other adults through the chorus. In the chorus, male cicadas will produce sounds for the purpose of attracting females and their mating. In stage two, infected cicadas will produce diploid resting spores cell falling to the ground and will eventually infect the marginis. In later stage two phases, the fungus will be visible as the insects abdomen has fallen off. Figure 15 illustrates 
stage two of Las Escuelas y Quintina in the Great Sequita. Methods for DNA extraction. When testing for molecular sequence of procedures that must be followed. For instance, after identification is done, two millimeters of the insect's abdomen will be cut off because Wolbachia infects the gonatal sex cells. Afterwards, the lysosome will be added because it maintains the pH, it protects DNA from acidic degradation, and it separates DNA from other solar bees. Then, the water bath is conducted to slow down the process of the insects that break down the DNA. And the centrifuge is used to separate molecules by weight. Consequently, bimolar sodium chloride is added to separate proteins and carbohydrates from the DNA. And to protect DNA from enzyme degradation, the ice bath must be conducted. The restriction enzyme used for this process is known as TERNase, which helps in the polymerase chain reaction process, or PCR. The PCR duplicates the DNA strands to therefore have enough for the electrophoresis gel. The electrophoresis separates molecules with electricity. Therefore, when the results come out, the 16S RDNA from Wolbachia can be identified at 438 base pairs, and the cytochrome C oxygen gene found in the insect can be identified at 709 base pairs. Methods for massless porosity in acculturation. First, LB agar was made on a hot plate. Then, the plates were poured and left to solidify. After the LB agar was completely solidified, the cicada's abdomen was swapped and with the Q-tip, and with that same Q-tip, the plates were streaked. Then, the plates were taken to incubate at 30 degrees Celsius for four days, and afterwards, the fungus was identified under a microscope. However, the abdomen of the cicadas infected with massless porosigidina was particularly harder than those who were not infected. This made it easier to identify the cicadas who were infected and those who were not. Figure 40 shows cicadas type 11 abdomen, and as you can see, it has fungus growing inside of it. Figure 41 shows cicadas 511 side of the plate and it has fungal colonies growing on it. So unfortunately to um, keep with our time schedule, I am going to have to cut off the video there, but we still do have time for some um, questions. And if you guys would also like to briefly um, describe the conclusion of the experiment, that would also be wonderful. All right, so basically our research focused on the insect, um, focused on the insect called a periodic cicada that emerges once every 13 or 17 years. We tested for a bacteria, Wolbachia pipientis, and a fungus, Massospora cicadina. Uh, results are shown later in the videos, but we discovered that many of the cicadas that we were captured ha happened to have empty abdomens, which was an odd discovery that we found since they were, they appeared all healthy when they were collected. Also, only the males were found to have empty abdomens. Even the females that were infected still had their inside organs, but the, only the males um, lacked the necessary organs. And, and as for Wolbachia, um, many of the, the females that, were, that we tested for Wolbachia turned out to be their infection was higher than the ones published in other literature that we found. Are there any questions that might be, that we can clarify? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Um, so how were the specimens collected? Because you said they only hatch every 13 to 17 years, correct? Yeah, and the last time they, they hatched was in 2004. And then recently, our professor went to three states, Ohio, Indiana, and Kentucky, and we, they captured the cicadas there. So they were captured pre-hatching? Was that the idea? No, they were hatched. They, they were found healthy um, and on trees, and they were just captured there. Huh. 
Thank you. That answers my question. Any other questions? Do I have time to ask a question, Taylor? Yes, you. <laughs> okay. So do you have uh, any indication that either the bacteria and or the fungus are having detrimental effects on regional uh, populations of the cicada? Well, um, we found that, we'll, that because of feminization, Wolbachia is, before in the presentation, um, decreasing the gene pools of the cicadas and is becoming a detriment to the population as a whole. Okay, thank you. Yeah, excellent presentation. Thank you. I really enjoyed that. Any other ones? All right. Well, if there are uh, if there are not any other questions, um, thank you so much for your presentation, as well as um, explaining more towards the end, since I did unfortunately have to cut the video. Um, I'm going to um, pass it back to Katya. All right. Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, next up, we have uh, a review of ferrofluids synthesis. Uh, the presenter is Oscar Olson. Did I say that right? Uh, close, A. Olson. A. Olson. Oh my gosh, darn. I'm sorry. No, no worries, no worries. Are you ready to go? I think so. Okay. Uh, let me bring up my presentation. Uh, so, uh, my presentation focuses on ferrofluid, which uh, I have a wonderful image here to kind of show it. Uh, Ferrofluid is a stable colloidal suspension of ferromagnetic nanoparticles in a carrier liquid. What that essentially means is that there's a bunch of very tiny uh, magnetic particles that are floating uh, stable suspension uh, within a carrier liquid, either a polar or nonpolar, depending on what surfactant is used. So to go along with that, uh, all those spikes that you saw, those beautiful uh, kind of protrusions from the liquid uh, are generated by following the magnetic field lines generated by uh, a magnet. Uh, the diagram here is a good representation of that. So you can see how they kind of expand outwards and wrap all the way around. Uh, essentially, they will con conform to those lines uh, and make spikes along them, which is an interesting phenomenon that you can see within uh, just magnetic particles in general. But it's more uniform whenever you see them with a, a, within a ferrofluid. So essentially to go along with that, uh, magnetic field lines are more condensed the closer you get to a magnet. And then they of course expand the farther away you get. And so uh, essentially, as you can see in this diagram, uh, they will split or make smaller and smaller spikes the closer you get to the magnet and much larger and more rounded spikes the farther away from the magnet you get. Uh, which if we look here, kind of an interesting one, the, the little top magnet here that the fluid is going up into, you can see that uh, the spikes are very small. Uh, that's because they're very, very close to the magnet where these are farther away from it. So ferrofluid nanoparticle synthesis, because that's what's really uh, the, the composition of ferrofluid is the nanoparticles that are embedded within the liquid. Most commonly reported, the synthesis methods are co-precipitation and thermal decomposition. Both of them have the same goal of producing a magnetic nanoparticle, typically magnetite, uh, which is Fe3O4. The reason for this is that uh, magnetite is highly magnetic, uh, and the uh, different synthesis methods are aiming to create uh, nanoparticles in the range of approximately 10 nanometers, as those are the most stable when suspended. If you get higher than that, they produce uh, unstable suspensions that will eventually drop out as a precipitate. So for the study, co-precipitation is the focus, as that's what I had available to, to study for it. Um, and also, uh, to further explain what co-precipitation is, uh, it involves a reaction between two different iron compounds, uh, iron three and iron two. Those are just the different charge states of the uh, particles. Often uh, iron chloride solutions is what I used. Um, and they are combined in a water bath. And then uh, after the addition of a base, 
they will produce uh, magnetite. So in an ideal scenario, which is inert, of course, no oxygen, uh, the ratio would be uh, a two to one of iron three to iron two. Uh, that solution would be stirred vigorously, which would be uh, the, the cause for the particles to form in a low nanometer range. So this is a bit of complication though. Essentially, as you stir the reaction mixture, uh, you're going to be introducing more oxygen uh, by creating more surface area. Uh, the benefit of stirring quicker is that you will get smaller particle size, which is necessary for the suspension. But by doing so, you also introduce more and more oxygen, which causes more oxidation, which can disrupt the balance of ratios. So uh, if you were to uh, have a normal precipitation of magnetite, it would occur as the first equation, which is essentially a two to one molar ratio of iron plus three to iron plus two. But because of oxidation, uh, iron two can be converted into iron three. Uh, this results in a uneven distribution and leaves a remainder or a, uh, a, a leftover amount of iron three, which can form a byproduct called maghamite, which is Fe2O3 as seen in the bottom reaction. The differences between them are uh, pretty intense, actually. Magnetite is highly magnetic, which is very good for what magnetite uh, or what ferrofluid uh, wants to be, which is a magnetic ferrofluid. Uh, magnetite doesn't really have a magnetic property, and or it does, but it's very, very minor. It's, it's uh, nearly insignificant. Because of this, magnetite is the desired product as it makes very good ferrofluid, but magnetite does not. So many researchers have uh, come up with different solutions for this oxidation issue. Uh, most of them adjust the ratio of these starting solutions. Uh, the most commonly reported that I found was a 1.7 to 1, which anticipates about 10% of the iron uh, 2 will convert into iron 3. So the reason for this study, essentially all of that prerequisite knowledge uh, is, is hinged on the fact that that's pretty common. Everybody seems to agree on that, except for Mighty and Agarwal, which they published a study that essentially contradicts uh, many of the popular assumptions that uh, Matt is the primary phase that is created. Uh, they conclude in their paper that uh, the main phase in the uh, ferrofluid uh, powders is magcomite instead of magnetite. And also that the oxidation of Fe2 to Fe3 is really, really quick or very rapid. And the prep preparation of the magnetite phase is difficult. So I originally made this study to essentially either conclude if this, if this is true and that it's primarily uh, magcomite in the solution or that's primarily produced, um, or if it's not, essentially was the original goal of this. So going through the process, I had to make a, uh, a method for synthesis. And this is my basic outline. Essentially, I would take the iron solutions of my iron chloride solutions, Fe3 and Fe2, to get a, uh, a ratio of them, dilute that ratio to 20 times uh, the initial uh, solutions volume with distilled water, stir it at a very high speed of around 1,200 RPM or higher, uh, add concentrated ammonium, uh, ammonium hydroxide dropwise to produce the nanoparticles. And then as the solution gets thicker because particles are being produced to increase the stirring. Uh, and then after that uh, has finished, all the ammonium was added, uh, I would add uh, a ammonium oleate, which is a surfactant, and then neutralize it with a hydrochloric acid, uh, converting the ammonium oleate to oleic acid, which acts as a surfactant or a long like, coating to the nanoparticles to allow them for, or to allow them to be suspended in a liquid. So going through all that, uh, it, it took many, uh, many weeks of uh, essentially repeated uh, synthesis to eventually find out what uh, was working and what wasn't. And it became pretty obvious. Essentially, if you stir too fast, uh, oxidation occurs uh, to, a, to a high extent, 
and the precipitate is brown instead of black, uh, which is an indicative of the magicomite. And if you stir fast enough, or not fast enough, sorry, uh, it results in particles that are too large. So instead of creating a ferrofluid, you instead create more of a sludge that uh, doesn't have a, uh, a smooth liquid, uh, I guess, uh, visual to it. Essentially, it, it uh, clumps up and doesn't have an even distribution. Uh, if you add the ammonium hydroxide too, uh, uh, too slowly, the oxidation occurs again. Essentially, the, the time that it takes for the addition takes too long, and you get a brown precipitate again. And if you add the ammonium too quickly, the particles become uh, larger as they uh, don't have enough time to, to spread the, uh, the previous drop around in the solution. So essentially, you have to find a balance between all of these different factors. Uh, my final solution to it was essentially a, uh, a very tall, thin reaction vessel and a small propeller stirred at a fast speed so that the edges of the reaction would still be stirred at a high enough speed to allow for the nanoparticles to form at a uh, even distribution. Uh, and the way that I added the uh, ammonium in a controlled manner was with a uh, addition funnel, as you can see on this right image here. I also added a, a white paper background so that I could have better image quality for uh, the synthesis, which we'll be able to see here. So the small video that I took, uh, which demonstrates the, the final uh, solution uh, after everything has been completed and the stirring has stopped essentially, what you can see is the nanoparticles slowly falling out of solution uh, because of the uh, oily oleic coating on them makes it so that they are not soluble in the water solution that this is. So essentially they just all drop out uh, nearly immediately. And we'll get to see the, uh, uh, the sample here. So, Essentially, like I was saying before, uh, the, uh, the spikes that are generated with uh, magnetic nanoparticles are the same, whether they're out of solution or in solution. That is because they just align with the magnetic field lines. So this is uh, a sample without any uh, carrier liquid, and this is a sample with a carrier liquid. So the primary difference between these uh, is the, um, the more uniformed spike pattern. So on the left side, you can see a lot of the spikes are more jagged. Uh, they have an unequal distribution, whereas when they're put in a carrier liquid, they have a more even distribution uh, and a more uniform appearance. So this was my uh, final product which was uh, the best reaction that I was able to produce was uh, a 1.7 to one ratio, a quick addition of ammonia and a very quick stirring of around 1,200 RPM or faster. And the conclusion of this was that uh, the products that I formed that uh, had a high oxidation level uh, did not create a viable ferrofluid. They would not spike. Uh, or they would have a uh, poor distribution of uh, nanoparticle size. So in conclusion, uh, special thanks to uh, Dr. Kayasa and uh, Professor uh, Koppel. They were uh, great assistance to me throughout this, provided many advices and uh, problem solving. Uh, the reaction in general was very difficult to uh, uh, actually produce a, a viable uh, product. So they were invaluable in all of the research. And additional thanks to New Mexico AMP and SRPD for the funding that was used to get the equipment necessary for this reaction, uh, and also for the time it took, which was uh, kind of astounding in terms of what I'd initially anticipated. Uh, but in conclusion, if there's any questions, I would be happy to answer them. I have a question. Yeah, go Bill ahead. Bill Norris here. We've met a couple of times, Oscar. Um, are you continuing research on nanoparticles? And if so, what's the focus of that research now? 
Um, in addition so, to this product, I thought your presentation was excellent. I'm not a chemist. I was able to follow most of it. So uh, <laughs> kudos to you, but I'm going to let you answer the question. Uh, thanks for that. Yeah, uh, part of it is trying to make it uh, somewhat legible. Um, yeah. so, <laughs> so this is kind of a follow up on a review paper that I've been working on with uh, Dr. Ilya Medina. Uh, so this is this is more the conclusion of the uh, the, the nanoparticle research. Uh, I don't think I'll be working with very many nanoparticles in grad school. Uh, but if I do, I'd be happy to, to follow up on, uh, on these uh, nanoparticles, these fair fluid, uh, based magnetite and magamite. I think that they're very interesting, uh, but I may not get to research them anymore, which would be kind of sad. Okay. Thank you. Can I ask no you something, problem. Oscar? Yeah, go ahead. I was just curious, you, you, um, was it, is there any reason or what? Uh, I'm, my guess is that you had to do a slow introduction of ammonia, but was there any way to, to set up a stir bar in a vacuum? Uh, so the issue with the stir bar, at least what we had available to us, it wasn't able to stir it fast enough to make the mm -hmm. nanoparticles of the right size. Um, oh, yeah. do they have such a thing? Seems uh, like you, could, you would... I don't know. It just seems like you put it in a vacuum and use a, stir, a magnetic stir bar. But yeah, I guess you're not 1200 RPMs. <laughs> yeah, I, there was a few um, articles that I'd seen that that had a very quick stir, uh, stirring capacity. Um, but I wasn't able to find one that was uh, in the price range that I had a budget for. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. Yeah, uh, yeah. Other, uh, uh, I also looked into alternatives. Um, there are some kind of interesting propellers that have a very low, um, I, I forget the name for it, but essentially they, they introduce very little oxygen during stirring. But an interesting issue is that you can't actually expose any metal during the reaction because the Fe3 solution is actually very corrosive and it will eat away at any iron that's present. Mm, yeah. And so it's kind of a, an interesting balance, but I like the vacuum idea. I, if I, if I had a chance, I'd actually do that <laughs> or well, at I least just, try I, it. I, I watch too many Nile Red videos on YouTube, so. <laughs> oh, yeah. He's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I like it. All right. Anyways, that's cool. Thank you. What, oh, I was going to ask you, what's, what's, uh, what, what can we do with, with nano uh, fluid? Oh, yeah. So ferrofluid, fluid, it's using a lot of things. Um, some of the more interesting ones recently have been uh, in the biomedical industry. So used as like a contrast agent for MRI. Uh, and then as a, uh, as a way to deliver uh, um, treatment to very specific areas. So for hypothermia treatment, for instance, um, you can actually bond a, uh, uh, a medicine essentially to the surface of those surfactants that you attach to the nanoparticles, and then you can use magnets to deliver them to a very specific spot. Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> That's yeah. interesting. So you get the, the, the ferrofluid inside the body and then guide it with magnets. Exactly, yeah. Wow, okay, that's crazy, all right. <laughs> uh, and then aside from that, it has a very high density as a liquid um, because it is essentially just a liquid filled with iron. Um, and so it has a higher density than most other liquids. So it can be used as a dampening thing in like loudspeakers as well. Just like there's a lot of very interesting like side um, uses of it. it. It finds a place. Loudspeakers and, and <laughs> ferrofluid. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I would have never thought. <laughs> yeah, I know. It was one of those uh, weird ones where I was like, oh, OK, <laughs> so that's what it's used. Now you got me going. I'm going to I'll be in a rabbit hole for the next hour. Yeah, it's always very fun. It's one of the most uh, interesting things to play with uh, of any of the research that I've done. Uh, it's, it's super, super enjoyable. I've lost many hours already. <laughs> <laughs> for the better. Alrighty, we have time for one more question. Anybody have another question? Okay, thank you so much, Oscar. That was great. Yeah, no problem. Can I hand it back to Taylor? Yeah, please. Ready. Again, job well done, Oscar. Um, 
our, I believe our final live presentation um, is the analysis of STEM postdoc narratives, my experience as a research assistant funded through SRPD by Gia Rowland. Hi. All right, are you guys able to see my screen? Yes. Wonderful. So what uh, this project looked like for me was mainly doing a lot of qualitative data analysis. So we analyzed between 30 and 40 interviews from students who were in postdoctoral programs and asked them what their experience was like. And then we found codes and tried to answer why. So we looked at prominent themes and it was a lot of coding. <laughs> so my experience was lots of reading. These interviews were really long. And initially I found making codes difficult because I couldn't really see the big picture. I knew what we were looking for. And as I continued to um, look through these interviews, we found more common themes and common codes and it was really interesting, but having only uh, seen the very preliminary steps of what we were doing and not being able to see what the end result was going to look like or what the analyzing process was, it was a little bit confusing. It, it kind of felt like I was coding blindly sometimes, but I did really um, enjoy learning about these relationship dynamics and this uh, community of science and um, yeah, so what I will be talking about is tailored to my own interests and there were a lot of other really important themes such as uh, the decentralization of academia, neoliberalism, academic capitalism, journalism and publications losing qualitative value and being more uh, clickbait and who can post a tweet the fastest and other really, really important uh, ideas that we found from this. So what I did learn and what I will be talking about today is the prominent theme of being single. It stood out, especially in the STEM field and being single is a huge advantage. And what that means is not having children, not having um, a spouse, not having other uh, family responsibilities means that you are an advantage to yourself as well as the lab that you're working in, the science that you're doing because uh, scientists without kids have more time to devote to the science that they're doing, which means that um, the more time that you're spending on it and the less distractions you have, you do have a better chance of getting published. So when you go home and you don't have to make dinner for your family or your kids, you don't ever have to fully clock out if you don't want to, you could go home and continue to read, do science, um, that sort of thing. So being a female does make this more dis disadvantageous uh, if you are not single because um, partially because of patriarchal gender expectations, the mom is the quote unquote caretaker, but also if you are a man and you're not single, you're not going to have to pop out every few hours to breastfeed and you're not going to have to go on maternity leave and that sort of thing. So although, um, when you apply for these postdoctoral fellowships, they're not going to tell you that you can't have a family and that you can't have children and that you can't be married, but it's kind of insinuated that your work is going to be more important than your family. So another prominent theme was being stuck, which kind of overlaps uh, being single. It is especially prominent in STEM as well, just because it's kind of like, oh, okay, well, what now? Um, so, after you have uh, a PhD, it, your options are really limited and it seems like doing a postdoc or two or three or four is your best bet. And um, it's easy to feel like you're stuck or caught up in academia. You could go into industry, but that has uh, issues of its own. And the quote, it's what you do was a huge uh, theme that we ended up coding for a lot of the interviews because when we would ask people, oh, why did you end up doing a postdoc fellowship? 
it's what you do. <laughs> um, so another reason why people are stuck is because the lack of funding. Um, most of the interviewees that we talked to had a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, a PhD, and it generally wasn't their post first postdoctoral fellowship, which can be between two and four years. And with all of these degrees and all of this experience and all of this previous research that they've done, they still are only making enough to barely cover their rent. A lot of times they don't have um, their basic necessities met, especially when uh, they're coming from foreign countries and they're on um, a conditional visa or green card or that sort of thing. And so um, health insurance is often an issue. Getting a credit card is often near impossible. And there are a lot of hurdles to jump through when it comes to uh, money. So um, it's not always a good experience. And one of the most interesting observation I gathered was that uh, demographics and job alignment are very, very, very intertwined. I think that was the most interesting part of what I gathered from doing these interviews. Um, so if you're a woman in science, it's really likely that you're gonna fake micro, face microaggressions, um, feel like you're in a man-dominated industry, feel like you couldn't settle down and start a family, um, have to deal with comments and that sort of thing. And being uh, someone who is religious is also really difficult because for science especially, it's kind of seen as mutually exclusive. It's like, oh, well, there's science or there's religion. And um, there were a few religious people who were made fun of and feel like they had to hide their religious identity and couldn't talk about it because of um, the science community. And um, most of the minorities that we interviewed who had an accent felt like they were treated differently, made fun of, not taken seriously. And being a minority or a person of color means that it's likely you'll be tokenized. So what that means is if you are um, a person of color in STEM and you're in a lab full of non-people of color, you um, may get your picture taken or be plastered on their website or otherwise shown um, used to make the lab seem more inclusive than it is. So isolation was another really prominent theme. Um, oftentimes when people go into uh, postdoctoral fellowships, they need to relocate, whether that's on um, a larger scale, such as leaving their country or um, relocating to a different university within the States. And so uprooting yourself is obviously very physically isolating uh, when you're not around your friends or the same groups that you were. Um, there were a few people who used the term touch starved, which was something that was new to me. Uh, it's when you're used to hugging your family or being around friends or holding hands with people and going into a very uh, professional science community, you don't have any um, physical touch. And they uh, mentioned that that is stressful. It's also really mentally isolating because you don't have a lot of free time. Um, when you call your mom and you call your friends and you talk about what you're doing in your life, there are not very many, uh, there's not a lot in common. Most people don't really understand the very specifics of the science that they're doing and it makes it hard to talk about their personal life with people around them. Um, when they are in the lab with their colleagues, there's a level of competition because a lot of times they're all racing to get the same publication and they're scared of getting scooped by the other person. And so it's um, kind of an awkward relationship working together, but also being competitive. And this can lead to the depletion of mental health for many. Um, the university that we were looking at did have some resources for these people to take advantage of, but it didn't really seem um, sufficient. So the main takeaways that I got from this were that I believe that this smaller scale that we looked at uh, the in, in STEM specifically can 
be blown up to represent a larger percentage of people, not only in academia or in STEM specifically, but on a broader scale. And I think that the reason why I didn't know a lot about these ideas or these groups of people was because it's very exclusive. You don't come across a lot of people who have this many degrees and are um, doing this science. And um, it's not something that uh, a lot of people know about. And I think the biggest takeaway was that um, having more than a decade of schooling, lots of degrees on your wall, finding out new science, being published doesn't guarantee happiness, money, job, alignment with your job, worth, important, um, sorry, this. feeling important or valuable, and it doesn't create family security either. So, um, any questions? Uh, I have a question, yeah. Um, so, in general, what uh, was there any methods that uh, the people that you interviewed talked about as like ways of that they maybe cope with these issues? Yeah, we did talk a little bit about that. Um, most of the people reported trying to take advantage of the resources that I mentioned on um, on the university's campus. They would mention trying to decompress with family and um, yoga, meditation, exercise, that sort of thing. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it seems about right. <laughs> Yoga is a pretty good way of uh, de-stressing. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I guess I have a comment. I, you know, I got a PhD in in history, and uh, I always tell people jokingly, if you're crazy enough to get a PhD, do it. <laughs> um, and uh, I guess what has driven me when I think about your presentation has driven me to sort of deal with some of the issues that you mentioned was my continued interest in the discipline of history mm -hmm. like if i've gone this far i must well keep on right and uh and then there's like uh i maybe it's what the one uh wendy and her, her idea of, of flow like uh you know when i'm in academe and i'm at my job I'm sort of in the flow and mm -hmm. maybe that's how I've dealt with this I'm not too sure you got me thinking so yeah thank you thank, thank you. you I have a question sure. yeah so what inspired you to do this study and how does this influence your professional goals having contemplated these fascinating results. Right, so I think that- What it, is your background? I'm a social work major, so it aligns with my academic trajectory in that way where I'm interested in um, the social issues that people face and in their different uh, environments. Okay, so you're, are you a undergraduate, graduate student? Yep, I'm in my third year undergraduate. So does, do the results of this study, which are very fascinating, uh, do they causing you maybe to hesitate going on to grad school or? I think my uh, graduate school degree is gonna be a lot more um, applicable. I'm gonna jump straight into the field and not have to do any postdoctoral fellowships. <laughs> so I think it makes me excited. Part of me was like, oh, just drop out and go to trade school and call it a day. No, I'm joking, but it didn't create any hesitation, no. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, and I, I concur with what Dr. Fritz had to say. I, I'm a, I teach over here in natural sciences and um, I'm fascinated by my subject area. I've been in this field for a long time and of course you have to make a living too. Right. And, uh, and you have to juggle family and all the things that you brought to the forefront in this presentation, but yeah. it's been worth it for me and it is a tough road, <laughs> no question about it. So uh, good luck to you uh, as you move forward and. Uh, your career, education and career. Thank you, I appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Taylor, uh, is there anything else uh, you want to do in terms of moderating uh, this last presentation? A GS presentation, that is? Um. 
I don't believe so. I think the only thing I just like to do is just remind um, those that are watching or are going to watch the recording um, that there are the digital posters and videos um, just to check those out. Yeah, in fact, that's what I was going to close with. So, well, let, let me let me uh, just before I do close out um, our uh, our session. Here, um, is there any last minute questions uh, for Gia before I make my closing remarks? Okay, so yes, indeed. Um, please go to the Canvas site where we have digital posters and videos um, that um, as I answer, uh, Dr. Copel's, uh, Professor Copel's question, they, they will be available uh, for many days after this event. All you have to do is just go to the symposium webpage, which is built inside the university's larger webpage, and then you'll see the link to that Canvas portal, and that should bring you straight into the Canvas shell, where you're going to see uh, presentations from Dr. Klein's uh, classes. You'll see uh, if, uh, presentations on, on uh, art, uh, natural sciences, as well as history. And uh, also for those that you know, participated in today's uh, um, sem uh, symposium, remember, put, this, put your presentation on uh, into your resumes, into your curriculum vita, because it's gonna help build those uh, those resumes that might just help you land a job in the future. And um, without further ado, uh, thank you for uh, your participation. And I will leave this Zoom uh, room open uh, for the time being. If you have any questions or comments, uh, I'll be available. And um, thank you. So um, adios. Thank you, everybody. It was a pleasure. Great. See ya. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everybody. Awesome okay. job. See you Thank later, you, Dr. Everybody. Coleman. Thank you guys for your efforts. It's just, I'm sorry I had to leave. I feel like I got shortchanged. I missed out. Thank you guys so much for doing this. Yep. Yep. Well, I guess I'll go ahead and uh, work with uh, um, the folks in charge of the calendar and officially post on behalf of the committee the date of the spring version of this symposium, which is by tradition Thursday of Tuesday of Dead Week. That's when we do it in the spring. So that'll be in late, late April or early May. I've already had a few inquiries uh, about the, the date of the next symposium, believe it or not. So something for you to file away. Tuesday of dead week. Okay. In spring. Okay. And uh, thanks, Tuan, for putting, uh, to make sure this uh, yeah. went. Uh, definitely, Tuan, he went out of his way to uh, post uh, the presentations into the Canvas shell. So, so he was helping out, I guess, uh, the media technology people. So we appreciate that, Tuan. Hopefully next spring we'll be able to be in person. Yeah, yeah, we'll see. Hopefully. Yeah.